Thank you very much. Well, good morning to all. And I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our day today. This is a special meeting that we will engage in strategic planning and how important that is in any business or in a personal life to have a plan as to how to move forward. So I would like to welcome all members of council uh, today to our meeting, all of our staff that are in attendance, and I would welcome staff. Please join in. There, this is a team. We are all together. So I would really welcome our staff to join us uh, with your input. It is very valued and it is welcome. Special welcome to Vicki Lass, the Director for Economic Development for Huron County, indeed a, a friend and a familiar face to Never, freeze, never freezes on a nice spot, does it? No, <laughs> never. The deputy on a spot. mayor would gladly jump in and finish Glenn's <laughs> remarks, but I have no idea what the heck he was going to say. <laughs> I think Glenn's frozen in time. Looks like he's logged off. He's trying to get back on again. I would think. So while we're waiting for Glenn to come back, I might just mention that our first exercise of the morning is going to be a round table. So I am going to call on each and every one of you, not just council, but staff, and ask you to take a look at um, what we've accomplished since our meeting back in September, or sorry, October 31st of 2019, seems a lifetime ago, um, till today. And just comment on one accomplishment that you are most proud of, because you have accomplished a lot of work in that time period. So while we wait for the warden to join, if you just want to take a look at that table that Caitlin circulated and think about what you're most proud of, one item, um, just forewarning, I will be calling on everyone. Caitlin, I haven't got that table. Was it an email? It was part of the agenda package. It's called Strategic Plan Update. Okay, I'll look again. Um, if you don't have it, I will happily put it up so that- I you didn't get it either. All I've got is the three presentation foils. Hey, Caitlin, you said it's on the website, right? They yeah, it it's it's through the agenda. The agenda package was published last week. Yeah, I I saw it last week. I'm having trouble finding it in my email, but I did read it last week, Caitlin. It did come through the email as an attachment somewhere, but now I don't know where I put it. <laughs> I will share my screen and show it perfect. <laughs> right now, and then that gives you a little bit of prep time. Uh, there we go. Okay, so you had four pillars that you were developing under, working under, community development. So anything that's shaded in light green is either complete or it's in progress, okay? If it's in white, um, incentives to attract beautification of vacant buildings, it, we haven't started that one yet, okay? So that's community development. Uh, I'll give you a moment to read that. And then I'll take you down through the document to the next pillars so you can take a look. So moving along, and I'm happy to go back if you haven't had enough time to read. We had a number of infrastructure goals and I'm happy to announce that you have either completed or have in development, in progress, all of your infrastructure goals. So this is a quite a lot of work that you have been able to accomplish since the end of 2019. So most of the work that you've done, you've done through the pandemic. 
Oops, I'll give you a bit of time to read that and then I'll move on to your agricultural pillar and then on to your HR pillar. Yes, Anita. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, what you're showing me on the share screen, Vicki, I'm going back to the e-scribe that um, Caitlin has sent us and I don't see where it matches up. I'm, I'm trying desperately to watch your screen and look at my iPad at the same time, but it's, um, and, and it has to do with age probably, but I can't seem to find it, how it no, coordinates. No. Okay, Caitlin, like, can you help me out? Yep, so it should be the second attachment under item three, but I've also emailed all of council a copy. So if you have your email open, I sent you the agenda package. It should include that update table at the very end. I think I see it now. I wasn't maybe scrolling far enough. Um, yeah, so it's the last, uh, I think, four or five pages. You have to get through the initial presentation slides, and then it's there at the end. Okay, that would have been helpful, I guess, if I'd have known that. I would have read that, but, you know, with the email that was sent out the other day, it just said that, you know, see the attached. I'm like, well, there's no attached. Maybe it's coming in, um, you know, Thursday morning. So I'm sorry I haven't read this. I feel a little bit um, behind, and I apologize for that. I should have been a little bit... Um, not to worry, and, and when we do the round table where we discuss what you're most proud of, it doesn't have to be an individual item. It could be just um, what you're most proud of since we developed the first plan. So it could be more of an overarching arching comment, um, not to worry about the details, and we're gonna be digging deeper into all of this together. So there is really no behind, um, and just feel free to think about um, this is one way to frame your comments, but another way to frame your comments are items like um, quite truly when uh, Florence and Caitlin and I went through all of your goals and priorities goals and their status in preparation for the meeting. I have to say, I was extremely impressed um, with all that you have been able to accomplish while dealing with the pandemic. The amount of work that has been done and the focus that you've shown on your targets is quite impressive. So that would be my one um, statement about the work that's been done so far. And, uh, and repetition is okay. So feel free to just take a look. The next pillar that you did work on was the agricultural pillar. So um, you can see from this uh, that a couple of things were completed, but in this pillar in particular, there were a lot of public facing activities, which COVID-19 did not allow for completion. So we'll be looking a little more at those. But some of the things that you did accomplish were significant, like a community coordinator. And then last but certainly not least is your human resources pillar. And again, tremendous work was accomplished here in spite of the pandemic. And about the only one, and we, we didn't highlight it, but we could have, training and education still took place. Pardon me. Mand mandatory training and education, onboarding training took place. So training and education took place, but some of the things like, um, attending conferences and uh, doing things that were a bit more outward facing were not. And so although it's not highlighted, it really is in progress. And the warden is back. So warden, we were just looking at the chart um, while you rejoined us, if you would like to continue with your opening remarks, that would be fantastic. Well, I apologize for the uh, uh, losing uh, internet service. However, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vicki, for continuing on. 
So just as an overview, and, and Vicky has started, so I'm not going to um, to interrupt. However, this is very, very important that we as a, as a, as a team, as ACW, that have a plan on what our goals are to achieve, and then we can work towards that. And so we're very appreciative of Vicki to lead us through this process today. We are particularly privileged in Heron County to be able to attract Vicki to become the Director of Economic Development. And with Cole, as Vicki uh, has alluded to in advance of the meeting, we have a wonderful staff of Economic Development. And, and we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with ACW today to lead us forward. So Vicki, with that, back to you for to lead us through the day, please. Thank you very much, Mayor. So um, I'm thrilled to be with you again. It's great to come back to, you know, to be able to start you off on your strategic planning process in 2019 and then return to be with you in 2022 to take a look at what's been accomplished is really great. Cole is with us here today. Cole is our business retention and expansion lead. So you did meet him the other day at the council meeting when we presented your summary results, your BRNE summary results. And Cole is helping to participate, helping me today by participating and offering some technical support. Um, and also it's an opportunity for uh, Cole to take a look at how I proceed or how I tend to look at community engagement. Um, he hasn't done strate strategic planning with me before, so we thought it was a great opportunity for him to, to join in and participate. So um, the ask for today was we have, we want to look at what we should be prioritizing and doing until the election. So in our last year in our term, um, as council, which of current term of council, I'm, I'm hoping to see your faces again in the new, in the new term of council. Um, what is it that we would like to concentrate on? And so we really have about nine months to look at getting work done before you'll be heading into your election and then a swearing in your new council. So to that end, we wanna take a look today at celebrating the successes, as I mentioned earlier, a look at what's left to accomplish, keeping in mind that the pandemic may or may not highly influence our work over the next nine months. So if there are certain things we're still um, keen to accomplish, how can we COVID proof them? How can we look at them so that we can still accomplish them at a distance if that's what's required or in a safe manner if it is a face-to-face -face activity? Also looking at some of the partnership opportunities that we might have to accomplish what's left in our strategic plan. We've broken the day into two sections. So in the morning, we'll look at our accomplishments and what's left to accomplish. Um, depending on the speed with which we get through that, our next step will be to look at prioritizing what we would like to still accomplish and then making a plan on what are the next steps and who will lead those steps. So the last two items are currently scheduled for our afternoon session, uh, but if our morning goes really quickly, we'll just keep moving through the agenda. We'll take a lunch break at around um, 11, returning at 12.30. That 11 o'clock could go to 11.30, allowing you one hour, 11.30 to 12.30 for lunch. But I just wanted to leave a cushion there um, to see how our morning progresses and Zoom brainstorming can be um, slightly different than, than brainstorming in person. So my ambition though is to have all of you contribute and talk and feel free to just sort of shout out, um, raise your hand if you like, you know, so that we can call on you and I will be sharing my screen periodically. Once we go to screen share, I won't necessarily see you because I have the ribbon of faces down the side of my screen. So if you raise your hand, you may also need to call out so that Cole and I know um, that you are offering a comment. Okay, great. So I'd like to start, as I said, with a round table of um, making a statement about one accomplishment that you're most proud of that has happened since the time we organized this plan um, at the end of October in 2019 until now. 
Um, and so that chart that I showed you briefly will assist you. Does everyone now have a copy of the chart in front of them or feel comfortable with making a statement that's larger than one item on the chart? We're good to go then? Okay, great, I see nodding heads. Um, so maybe we can start, uh, let's start at, at the top left-hand corner of my screen is Councillor Snowblin. Do you feel comfortable starting, Councillor? Okay, that's fine. Jen, would you like to start us off? Councillor Miltonberg. Sure, absolutely. It's not even a difficult task for me. The number one thing I'm proud, impressed, delighted, excited by is the hiring of our community coordinator, Caitlin Bost. I think she, aside from what the work she has done, opens up limitless possibilities, and I'm delighted that we have done that. Fantastic. Yes, I think that's a wonderful co accomplishment as well. Thank you, Councillor Miltonberg. Um, can we go to Deputy Mayor Watt next, please? Sure. Uh, Jennifer sort of stole what I was going to say, but for me, it goes back to my first term in 2010 when I shocked a few people by suggesting that if we wanted to do anything, we we're going to have to hire an economic, the economic development officer. Uh, this administration has actually done something about it. We've morphed from economic development to community development, to a community development committee, to the coordinator, to the now deputy clerk, and I am just immensely impressed with the things that have happened along the way that uh, council has paid attention to in terms of planning for the future. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. And when I call on you, remember, repetition is okay. If Caitlin is the best thing you have done in the last couple of years, that's great. I'm okay with that. Um, and, uh, and also, if I call on you and you're not quite ready, please just let me know, okay? Um, Councillor Fisher, would you care to go next? Sure, um, I had a couple. It was hard for me to pick one out of these two. Um, I, I was very proud of us providing um, land for uh, attainable housing in Dungannon. And the other one was uh, in a green vein, was eliminating the single use uh, plastics from our properties, our offices and sheds. Fantastic. Those are both wonderful. Thank you very much, Councillor Fisher. Um, if I could go to Councillor Forster, please. I guess I should have unmuted a while ago. Um, one thing I'm proud of is allowing uh, second residents on each farm because I've always thought the way the Amish do it for their elderly, that's just a big fire hazard. And aging parents, myself, uh, I think it's a really good idea. Okay, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Councillor. Um, let's go to Councillor Van Stone, please. <laughs> Heavy on the Van Stone. Um, <laughs> anyways, thank Sorry. you very much for that. Um, Anyways, I'm, all I can say is I'm very proud of it all, but uh, the community involvement uh, has really uh, impressed me. I like that. I like to see the way Dungannon has uh, come together and got a park. And, and uh, I think that's the heart of, the, of, a, of a township is uh, community involvement. So uh, I'm very proud of that. Thank you. <clears throat> Not only is that something to be incredibly proud about, um, it's something that's incredibly is, it, is an incredible accomplishment during the pandemic because one of the things the pandemic has done has started to erode our sense, sense of community with people isolating and staying in their homes, with differences of opinions on how to approach um, the pandemic. We have seen a loss of community. So the fact that you have seen a rise in community um, involvement and commitment is really a wonderful accomplishment. Thank you. Councillor Snowblin. Well, I was hesitant to answer your question earlier because I was curious to know if everyone was thinking in terms of tangible or intangible. So mine were more of an intangible, you know, uh, warm and fuzzy feelings kind of thing. And uh, one of the, I had two actually, one was uh, uh, 
I'm proud and I admire how not only counselors, but particularly staff have navigated around the pandemic. It hasn't been easy for any entity, business, household, anything, but I think that uh, our staff have done a very good job of um, navigating that. And also I am proud of um, how we, res as a council and in, in conjunction with staff, that we respect each other's opinions. Um, and it doesn't, uh, I have always said that you don't have to agree with everybody, but if you disagree, it's in a respectful tone. And um, I'm, I'm proud of how we do that. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Councillor Snowblum. Um, so I would like to move on to staff now and hear what you're most proud of um, in the last couple of years of work that has happened. If we could go, if we could start with Florence, please. So um, for me, I believe that the two, there's two things that I'm most proud of. Um, and the first one is um, having Caitlin on board. I think that was a big one. I think without that, a lot of what was on those lists would not have happened. Um, and the second one is uh, the goal of the knowledge gaps between generations and having that dealt with. I think within the last year, um, given with retirements and just the expanded facilities and with the priorities that are in the, the this plan, um, we were, um, I don't wanna say pushed, but it was necessary to be able to um, address the knowledge gaps by, by means of delegation. And I'm, I'm really proud of, of our staff for coming together and, and doing that to facilitate the needs of what council needs, so. That's fantastic, yes. And, and as we pointed out in the BRE, that succession planning piece, that sharing of knowledge between generations is vital um, in our volunteer organizations, in our municipalities, amongst our council members, um, and not just in our businesses. So thank you, Florence. That's a really excellent point. Could we go to Tom, please, next? Um, so having only been here for for uh, just a year now, I'm piggybacking on all of Brian's successes, but having, having been at another municipality and, and coming into this one, I could say that we should all be proud of the the, the, I did probably to steal Brett's answers. We're doing a lot of work to look forward. We're planning out our roads. We're looking into the future. We're not, um, we're not turtling and just trying to protect what we have. We're, we're advancing. So it's exciting to be part of that. And um, that would be my answer. Terrific. Thank you, Tom. And that vision is so important. And again, to reiterate, uh, Mayor McNeil's comments to have a strategic plan and to understand your vision and where you're going. I, I love strategic planning and to me it's just magic how when you write it down and you commit to it, it happens. Now it takes a lot of work from staff and it takes dedication from council. We won't forget that, but it's a magical piece that draws it together and keeps everyone on the same path. So thank you, Tom. Could we move to Brett, please? Oh, yeah, no, like, I could just echo what Tom pretty much said. He pretty well said that pretty pretty much perfectly, just the direction we're heading. Um, it'd be nice to be further along, but definitely proud that we're heading that way. Um, and then also the additions through the building department, obviously a little biased. Sorry, Caitlin. Um, <laughs> the staff we've added here, they've been great. They're, they're, with, them, with them, uh, my life would definitely be. Uh, difficult. So uh, yeah, definitely proud of the move uh, moves we made in uh, the direction we're headed. It's going to be a, an exciting five years, I think, uh, again, in ACW. So looking forward to it. Excellent. Thanks so much, Brett. Could we move to Ellen, please? Yeah, um, I think what I'm most proud of is staff and council's um, resiliency through the pandemic. Um, We've taken this as an opportunity for um, modernization and change and moving forward rather than focusing on, on all the, the negative of the pandemic. So I think um, we've all done a really good job of just looking forward and um, staying positive. 
Wonderful, a really great point. Thanks, Ellen. And on to Mark. I uh, kind of have a lot of the same comments everyone else does, but there's three things that kind of my mind, I know I'm only supposed to say one, but first of all, the communications, I found the communications uh, to be much better. Um, and again, uh, probably because uh, we have now someone that can focus on that, and that being Caitlin again. Number two was expanding our office and uh, doing the renovations in the sheds. And I'm proud that that's done and we can accommodate uh, everything here uh, with more staff. And the, the one I really, I want to key on on is the adequate staffing and that was part of your human resource screen and uh, uh, the adequate staffing um, I find right now in the building department we added on and in the office we did but um, succession planning I, I think as everyone knows here too uh, we since we last met we've we've the succession planning has moved forward a bit with uh, Ellen and uh, and Florence taking their different roles and my role changes so that's whole part of that whole process I, th I think that would be not my number one Thank you. Fantastic. Really great points, Mark. Thank you. And succession planning is not easy. Um, it is it is a difficult task. It is, um, it's just challenging. So I agree. Congratulations on that. Can we move to Caitlin, please? Yeah, I would say that I'm most proud of our movement in communication. So getting on social media platforms in the last year and updating our website. I think that we've seen a big improvement on how we get our information to residents. Um, and then also under the human resources, we hired two more summer students than we normally do last year and our junior positions in job shadowing. Terrific, thank you, Caitlin, that's wonderful. And if we could round out our comments back to you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, thank you very much, Vicki. And I'm particularly impressed with all of the comments of all that have spoken on this. I guess when it comes to me, what I'm most proud of is the cohesiveness of ACW council and staff and the progressiveness of this council. We have had a lot of challenges. And we met those challenges. We engaged, as Councillor Vanstone said, with our residents. And we followed the process. We were challenged on one of our decisions. And because we followed the process of our staff, that was dismissed. And this council, and I guess I, I look at it from a wider lens, I'm so privileged to serve with this council because we see the bigger picture. We embrace succession planning. We realized if we're doing more business, we need to have more staff to conduct that business. And we embrace that. We, our assessment in ACW increased more than any other municipality in Huron County. And that doesn't come by chance. It is because of the progressive foresight of this council and our staff and the vision, and we embrace each other. And we are the envy of a lot of municipalities within Huron County and abroad. When it comes our, to our municipal office that Mark spoke about, we realized that we needed to expand to accommodate our staff to do more business. Businesses are either terminal or they grow. And we have chosen to grow ACW. And I will suggest because of that, we have a safe environment for our staff. And that is so important. That is the responsibility of, of council to do that. And we have embraced all these things in continuing to move ACW forward. So those would be my things, Vicki, that I am most proud of with this council. That's and wonderful. Staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's wonderful. So some of the words that I heard that I really just want to revisit and emphasize for you are visionary. That's so important. Your vision of the future, you have enacted that vision. You have taken steps to make that happen. I really loved what Councillor Snowballin said about thoughtful and respectful. 
we don't often find that in any level of government. And that is so important to work well together as a council, but also work well together between staff and council. Um, communication has been heightened and it's seen as a priority and you have put your money where your mouth is, where your priorities are. And so communication has become really important at all levels and you've demonstrated that. You've shown real leadership in difficult times and made decisions where others may have downsized. You have grown. You have chosen to invest in growth and invest in your future. And resiliency, that you are a resilient group and you have faced the challenges of the last few years. And even with all of those challenges, you have accomplished the majority of what you set out to do in 2019. So I think we should all just take a minute and just feel very proud of yourselves for the work that you have done and what you have accomplished together before we start to look at what we're going to accomplish next. And if I may, I will share my screen and bring up the list. What I've done for you is I have compiled a new document that only has your incomplete activities on it. And I would like to share that with you. Okay. There. All right. So sharing under community development, the one remaining goal that you have is incentives to attract beautification of vacant buildings. Under agriculture, we have created an economic development committee in ACW that would bring ideas to council and pursue the SLED funding provided by the county. Now to be clear, you have still pursued the SLED funding and congratulations to your staff. You're, I just approved your invoice yesterday and you are the first group to submit a completed report for your SLED 2021 funding. Um, agricultural themed events that rotate in different communities. Of course, this was curtailed um, because of COVID. Agritours with local businesses for agricultural education as ambassadors for urban visitors and seasonal residents. Again, COVID had an impact on that one. Pursue learning experiences in other municipalities learn from other communities on how to lend expertise and find funding for small enterprises, publicize community and rural efforts as rural economic development. ACW is a place where urban meets rural in harmony. And then under human resources, we have the training and education piece, which we talked about the only reason this one wasn't complete was we were, you were unable to attend um, some of the conferences and things that you would have gone to and done some of that training, um, external training, although you have been very active on internal training and education and mandatory training. Uh, so I am going to make this a bit smaller so that we can get it more onto one page and still read it. Okay, all right. So these are the things that are on our list that are still of importance. And I'd like to talk through them a little bit. Um, normally this is where we do a bit of a breakout session and come back, but because this is an official council meeting, we will just work in the larger group um, at this moment. So, um, if, you, if we wanted to go item by item, I think that's the easiest way and entertain comments on those items. Incentives to attract beautification of vacant buildings. So the intent for this one, um, if we want to remember the intent, would someone like to share with us the overall intent of this statement? Yes, Jen, please. Well, I believe it stemmed uh, initially from Dungannon, uh, which was, <laughs> I won't, I won't use all the terms people use to describe it in, in a much larger terms, but an eyesore to put it, uh, nicely. 
Um, and uh, we don't have, um, what do they call them? Like the Lucknow Business Association where the businesses right. get together, do that. We don't that have to do that because we have settlement areas. So the question was, how can we make the main street, which no longer has retail, look a little bit less um, detracting from our image of a place where people would want to live. Uh, the Dungannon Community Alliance has made strides on that. I think what stalled us initially was it's all privately owned. There isn't businesses. How do we do this? And uh, but that is that was the driving factor from what my memory is. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, did anybody else want to comment on this objective? Okay. So do we still look at this as one of our priorities? Working on um, the overall appeal of Dungannon. Jen. I think that with the Dungannon Community Alliance, they are uh, six service groups who get comments from their groups and others are invited who are not in groups. And at the beginning, the focus was on very small things like, can't we get flowers on Main Street? Why don't we have flags? And then thanks to the, the organization of it all, they're, they're much bigger picture than that. And I think those requests will be coming to council in perhaps future budgets once the green space is done. Um, but they would be doing a lot of the legwork. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that council needs to necessarily take the lead on that anymore. I think it will be coming organically and someone else doing all the footwork, basically. Okay. Um, you did make a comment that there's no longer retail in Dungannon. So your downtown core in Dungannon is now more residential than retail commercial? Hi, Peggy. Yes, Councillor Vanstone. Um, thanks, Peggy. I, am I speaking to you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Good. Um, I think that this particular item is well underway. Um, the, the first steps that uh, was taking, and uh, I got to give Jennifer a real big pat on the back for that, is to get the committees and the uh, organizations going because it has to be driven from the grassroots to get this stuff done. And if you start in Carlisle, okay, um, the next three or four years in Carlo is going to make a tremendous difference. There's, there's a person who's bought the old uh, church. They're going to fix it into a beautiful home. Uh, the old stores are all being fixed up. Uh, the uh, other building that was in, you know, it was in not great shape, but it was, it's coming. And then you go up into Dungannon and you can see the change coming there now with the park and the people they're taking some interest in their community. So I think it's well underway. <clears throat> um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. The, uh, it occurs to me that the only thing I can think of other than the uh, Dungannon committee itself is the fact that Huron County has done away with the discount on vacant build tax rate for vacant buildings. But I don't think that's really going to have any impact on the people who will currently own the eyesores. Okay, great. Thank you for that point. Um, and Florence. So um, with regards to this actually exact topic, staff had a conversation the other day um, about Doug Gannon specifically, and it was thought that a lot of the uh, buildings on Main Street are being occupied um, I don't want to say, I don't think illegal is the right word, but you know, they're, they're buildings that are, that are meant to be commercial that are being lived in. Um, and we thought that it might be an appropriate time to have a conversation with the planning department about what options could we give um, from a official plan designation um, perspective on how we could accommodate uh, people being able to live in these places um, free and clear. So right now, um, because things are, say, you know, um, 
it, it may be a commercial building, but in the back they live, you know, so they can't really use the front of the building uh, because there's no commercial opportunity. So what can we do from a, from a planning perspective that could permit, um, you know, something more along the lines of attainable housing in that area so that some of these buildings could be used for what they're actually being used for. So um, just to give uh, council a bit of a, uh, an idea that we've had, we, we've talked about this recently and um, we're gonna be talking with um, Selena and the planning department about what could be done in this kind of vein. Wonderful, great points, Florence. So, um, so basically in a lot of ways, you're, we're seeing good progress on this item. And then to Florence's point, um, or let me back up. The communities are taking hold and really starting with uh, new purchasers, new owners um, to bring some more vitality and life to some of your areas that you were concerned about previously. And so as you stated, you know, the community will, will lead this. Florence brings up a good point that there is one thing that we, that you could look at from a council perspective or a staffing perspective. And that is, is there an opportunity to change the zoning from commercial to residential so that those who are living in the buildings would have the opportunity to more fully use the building or renovate the building so that it was more of a residential type property as opposed to a commercial property that people live in at this time? Florence, please. Um, just to follow up on that, I think we also need to recognize that it is a it is a main street of some kind, um, and we're also thinking about the opportunity to uh, I don't want to say make it easy, but we can't forget about the commercial opportunity that is there as well. So finding a balance between the residential and a commercial um, along that strip there um, is where the where the idea was going. Right, so they might be residential now, but there is a possibility that they could also still be wanted as commercial in the future. Jen. Well, one of the things I was kind of alluding to is exactly that. Um, now that the gazebo is completed enough for use, the DCA, Dungan Community Alliance, has uh, great plans and always had for to move their, they have a farmer's market, but it's at the ag ground, so it's not on you have to know where it is to find it. So they would move it out onto the main street. And they have talked before about how to beautify the buildings across the road. So it looks like a nicer spot a lot. And um, some of their thoughts were like, have people paint murals or hang banners, all of which have a cost, but a low cost that would go a long way if they got volunteers and that to do it. Um, and the fact that they have this uh, farmer's market going at the gazebo might spur opportunities across in the buildings across the way, which is why I kind of said it might be coming organically where we would need to yes. be open to small budget requests, but in an overall view that the one is spurring more of others, but they are privately owned. So they're not going to buy a banner to hang up just to make the, building look better for the people across the road, if you know what I mean. That's what I meant by that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and Anita. Thank you. Um, I, um, I appreciate um, Florence's uh, comments about staff looking at this and, and looking at ways to rezone this so that uh, there is a residential um, element that could be proposed. Um, although I have to say that if it, if it were me that were making the decision about zoning, I would be concerned probably about um, how busy, it's a, it's a highway that goes through there. And I know there's a reduced speed zone, but not everybody look, does that and it's not well enforced. And um, if I was the one that said, um, you know, made the decision solely on, on zoning on that, I would, I would probably take a good long hard look at that um, traffic uh, in a residential zone without any green space really between the highway and the, the residents. Um, I'm always in favor of not reinventing the wheel. And um, I'm, I guess I'm hopeful that um, someone will, will 
reach out to other communities that have um, had this same situation where it's uh, sort of an abandoned town, so to speak, uh, on a major highway and ways to, um, to, to look at improvement or renovation or rejuvenation or, or something along that line. And I, I know our staff are well connected with so many um, municipalities, not just in here in county, but uh, in elsewhere. I know it's been difficult with the pandemic to network, you know, through conferences and so on. But uh, I'd be I'd be fully in favor of um, looking at other communities, and maybe that's already been done. I don't know, but um, uh, as I said, I'm just always in favor of not reinventing the wheel, but also being progressive and forward thinking. I like I like um, some of the ideas that you've had, really. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Councillor Snowballon. Any other comments? Okay. So at this point, as we continue yes, through- Yes. Yes, oh great, Councillor Fisher, please. I, I just, a thought came through my, my, I was thinking as we were talking about the street in Dungannon and I thought of Europe and where you see um, houses where the front door is right almost on the curb through villages. I mean, it's very common, very, um, and traffic's moving quickly, but the front doors are right at the curb practically side by side. So it's just, it just came to my mind. <laughs> okay, great. And Brett. Oh yeah, just to kind of follow up on what Florence said and just to address maybe some of council's statements as well. Um, yeah, we, we did talk about it. We have reached out to the planning department, I think, uh, Selene will be reaching out to some of the economic development people with regards to this. Um, we recognize there's challenges like such as, these, is it even appropriate? Uh, you know, someday you may need that commercial back. So how do you find that balance? How do you walk those lines? They're servicing, parking, the sidewalks. Yeah, there, there's lots of things that staff understand as well. And it sounds like council understands. It's not just a straightforward answer. So I guess, uh, yeah, I think uh, council's pretty much up to date on uh, those conversations now, yeah. Um, any other comments on this item for community development? Okay. The only other thing I would note is that you do have the uh, vehicle of a CIP um, to consider as an option for this area as well. So a community improvement plan and supported funding from, house, from council to make um, changes. To, to offer support for changes to those buildings in that area. Um, so just a note, um, it may not be appealing at all at this time, but just that that is another vehicle that you do have to work with uh, as a council and a staff. Okay, so we're gonna proceed through the chart in this manner, and we're gonna take a look at these and then we'll decide come back and talk about if these are priorities or do we feel for this for example do we want staff to continue to explore and consult um do we want to continue to look for examples of other rejuvenated downtowns and what were the best practices that led to that rejuvenation uh, or do we feel that it's okay to let that go organically for the next nine months and then we can always readdress this um, in the next strategic plan session once new council is, um, is sitting. So did you want to have that, I just want to sort of take a, take a check here. Did you want to have that conversation about whether you would like to go forward and look at other options or would you like to wait and do that all, do all the options at once and pick what you feel are priorities? Uh, Deputy Mayor, and then Councillor Miltonberg, please. Thank you. Uh, I don't care which way we do it. I just think it's important that uh, we do it in the next nine months, not because if we wait till the next council, there's a, always a couple of years startup time till people really get comfortable spinning their wheels. So strike while the iron's hot. Okay, great. Thank you. And Jen? 
Oh, you're muted, Jen. I put my hand down, but forgot to unmute. Okay, I think probably in my mind, we are going to have uh, a lot of things we could do and it might be easier to decide at the end, which is the priority. I think we need to look at all of them, but which ones we need to prioritize would be easier to do if they were all in front of us. Perfect, and that would be my preference. I just wanted to sort of take a check and make sure everybody was okay with that process. Um, as we build out this chart, then we can refer back to it and look at what the actual work would be and decide what is a priority and, and what you want to move forward on. Um, even though you don't have, even though you've accomplished a lot already, there are still some key priorities here that will take some time and energy. So um, we can continue on with your permission. And the next one, now this one I have a question about because when Deputy Mayor Watt was speaking, he did talk about the formation of an economic development committee. Um, and maybe I misunderstood, but this item is to create an economic development committee in ACW that would bring ideas to council and pursue the SLED funding provided by the county. So I open the floor to comments. Jen, sorry. No worries. I was hoping Roger would take this one <laughs> because we did form the committee. Uh, Roger, myself, Florence, I'm not sure if Caitlin came in at the end and we were talking about how to engage uh, the public and we didn't want to just say, hey, who wants to join? We were looking at a more strategic uh, targeted approach and my memory is that's when COVID hit, but I'm happy to answer to anybody who has a better memory than me. And Deputy Mayor and then Florence? I'm not claiming I had a better memory, but what I do remember is that uh, a number of years ago, you, Vicki, led on behalf of Huron County, a agricultural economic development planning effort. Uh, and ACW at the time, the committee there was me, Jennifer, Florence, and uh, Jenna, I forget her last name. And we talked amongst ourselves about the advisability of embarking on that and came to the conclusion that we didn't have an overarching strategic plan within which to develop that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's no longer an excuse for not doing it. But it, in my mind, the, the attention sort of, I won't say drifted, I will say elevated from economic development to community development. Uh, I think if we concentrate on community development, economic development will fall out of that or will, will fall because, happen because of that. So uh, I'm sort of ambivalent on this one. Yeah, I, that is actually how I remember it as well. So, um, and Florence. So it, it, it wasn't an economic development committee that was, uh, was established, it was a community development committee. So uh, the, it was focusing on community, uh, pulling the community together, not necessarily on economics. So the goal and, and what happened in that committee was that committee um, pushed for the, com the, the position that Caitlin had on contract last year. Um, and that committee basically, once that position was in place, we took a back, a back burner and that was the, basically the goal of that at that time. So it wasn't an economic, it was a committee, it was a community. So the actual establishment of a community um, or an economic development committee did not happen. Um, so uh, I, a staff has had a bit of time to think about this too. Um, and my suggestion on this would be that the economic development committee that would come into effect in, 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 from a staff's perspective, we've got nine months of this council. We get a few members of council together with staff. We set out a terms of reference and we kind of establish what the purpose of the committee would be. Um, be it, you know, um, moving forward with a strategic, like a formal strategic planning process in 2023. And then we build on those, um, those goals from, from that strategic plan. However, we have it all set in place, ready to go, that one of the committees that gets appointed to at the first term of council is an economic development committee. 
so that it isn't something that just, you know, oh, we'll just, you know, it comes in after a couple of years. No, no, this, we plan to have it ready to go for November 15th for that first meeting of council um, for the next term. That's, that's where my thoughts as a staff is. That way we can use this time um, where we don't have an, a, a, a formal strategic plan in place to kind of prepare to hit the ground running once the new council comes. Okay, noted. Um, and thank you for that suggestion, Florence. Any other suggestions or conversations on this element of the agricultural pillar? Yeah, Jen. I think uh, Florence has nailed it. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Fantastic. We'll just highlight that because we like it. Is there anybody who would like to speak further on Florence's suggestion before we move along? If I could just for a second, Becky, and this, this is just another example of how our staff provide us facts and information and council can then embrace it and go forward. This is the way we work together and it's very much appreciated. Terrific, thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, moving along, agricultural themed events that rotate in different communities. Now, there's a couple of items here, this one and the next one, and I want you to think they're not dissimilar. Um, so this, the next one is agri-tours with local businesses for agricultural education as ambassadors for urban visitors and seasonal residents. And I, I, please correct me if I am wrong, but I see both of these as educational opportunities. So if I remember, Jen, I think you participated in an agricultural themed event I think it was in Kingsbridge and there were tractors and there were different displays and you invited seasonal residents and neighbors alike to come and learn more about agriculture. And then the second one is more taking them to where agriculture is happening instead of bringing agriculture to a centralized spot. So these may be similar in that the overall intent um, would be further education around agriculture. So I just wanted to make that comment because we may be able to address both of them in our conversation. So please, Jen, your comments. Yeah, that's, there were several things that went on there and if I might have a bit of leeway, Mr. Mary and Vicki to talk about this. The event that you are referring to was the rental of Kingsbridge Center. It was rented by, I believe it was the OFA or one of their subsidiaries and they did have a tractor day. Now Kingsbridge did also have a successful sled grant to do agri-tours um, and we had it all planned out for 2020 and so that did not happen. We actually got it um, extended to 2021, COVID was still happening, we didn't feel that was a great idea to bring out of town visitors and spread them throughout the community. So that, that proposal actually was spearheaded by Kingsbridge and we were going to do that. Um, and we were able to offer it because uh, we had the SLED grant because of course it's non-revenue generating really, it's for a different purpose, but we put it under um, promotion of the building, you know, to highlight. Um, not sure when that would resume. We do have the plan in place, but I did want to talk uh, on this subject with another related item. And I've already spoken with uh, uh, Caitlin about this, as well as Rick Sickinger from Huron County and uh, a couple other entities in Godrich. And the background is, just so you know, I'm not in conflict when I speak about this. Kingsbridge Center is owned by St. Joseph's Kingsbridge Community Registered Charity, whose mandate is to provide the building. We are in excellent fiscal shape. Um, the rentals, although our income is down 80% since 2019, we still, our op fixed operating costs are 19,000 and uh, last year we made 36. So the events that I'm talking about do not benefit Kingsbridge Center. We are pursuing a grant called Reconnect Ontario uh, which is for an event, which will be Kingsbridge the Musical 4. It is a historical play. And 20% of the grant, because they're trying to promote hospitality and tourism, 
is that you work with the hospitality and tourism in your municipality. Of course, ACW is not known for its hospitality and tourism industry. Um, so in speaking with Caitlin and Rick, um, the best way to get the 20% of the marks, um, which is why Kingsbridge is interested, but as a counselor, I think this is a fantastic idea. Caitlin suggested uh, creating a, a package where, you know, if you shop here or stay at our bed and breakfast or a campground, you get something off, uh, you know. So that's like kind of a one-time event. But I think that in the, in the big picture of ACW, were we actually to link all our small uh, suppliers like our, our people who sell honey or whatever and link our campgrounds together, which now with our communications person, coordinator, whatever Caitlin's called, sorry, I, I think that would do a real service to our value added agricultural producer. So this wouldn't end up being a, a one-off thing for a promotion of an event. It would actually link them together so that they could, you know, you know why it would be good. I can go on and on if you'd like, but I suspect you don't want me to. But that is what I find how we could help agriculture in our communities to help our, our value added agricultural people. And then the same thing, you know, you help. Eventually the, the one time, I think Kingsbridge was gonna run, run it once a month or something like that. But if people were coming from urban places and they had a list of here's where you could stay while you do this, here's some other local places you could visit on your own to buy locally sourced, sourced goods, it would be a real boon to both our hospitality and our, um, and our, our value added agriculture, as well as educational learning in the big picture. But that's, that's my whole big old plan here. Uh, I just thought I'd throw it out there. <laughs> I knew there'd be a monster plan in here somewhere, Jen. I just knew it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, I took the liberty of actually putting that down with ACW as a place where urban meets rural in the harmony. Um, because I think of agricultural themed events as a, on this weekend, we're doing this in this town. Um, I think of agritours as we're gonna take you into an agricultural business and show you how they function and their importance along a value chain. Now I may be wrong, but this is how I look at it um, to, to help educate our urban neighbors about what agricultural is, agriculture is and, and why it's so important to Huron County. Um, so I can easily cut and paste. This is the one advantage of a live document as opposed to a flip chart. Um, we'd have to be on sticky notes to move things around, but we don't have to be today. Um, Florence did have a comment and then Councillor Snowballin. Thanks, Vicki. Um, I would just like to kind of, um, I know Jen loves, loves the bigger picture and, um, you know, from a logistics standpoint, from a staff's perspective, we go, okay, how, 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 <laughs> um, you know, and, and there's lots of challenges that we, that I see, especially, um, is in, in the context of this nine month plan that we're trying to finalize. Um, so I think I, it is my suggestion that some of these items be quote, transferred to a form, formal larger strategic planning exercise that would be um, initiated in 2023. Um, however, I do believe within the capacity of what we have as staff right now, the biggest thing that we can do is help promote, help provide, provide funding through donations, promote through social media, our website, you know, whether we, you know, expand our social media policy to include um, agricultural themed events that we promote, that, that we will promote and, and, and share on, on organizations behalf. Um, we also have hall rent. We have the facilities that we can rent out. So there's certain things that we have within our capacity right now to be able to support the things that are happening in a broader community. Um, you know, and I, I understand that some of these things moving forward, say in a, you know, in a year or two, would, you know, um, through a, the Economic Development Committee, they would um, organize some kind of agri-tour. We have uh, hired a summer student who will help us facilitate this kind of thing. 
However, I see that as something that's a bit broader and beyond what we can do between now and October. So I'm, want, I'm thinking about how can we accommodate these types of, of goals with the resources that we currently have um, in a short period of time. So that's just my comment on, on, you know, I'm not trying to squash vision, but I'm trying to be realistic in how we can, <laughs> how we can actually partake and move it forward. <laughs> Sorry, Jed. I consider that scoping instead of squashing. So okay, thanks. <laughs> scoping comments are always important, especially with Jen's enthusiasm. So um, Anita, please. Um, thanks, um, Vicki. I, I think Florence is maybe touching on some of my thoughts in, in this, and I appreciate Jen's like big picture vision. I, I share those big picture visions, but I also know how difficult it is to sort of, um, you know, pinpoint each one. But I guess my question, Vicki, and I think I heard Florence kind of say this is, with this um, whole um, agriculture theme events and urban meets rural and harmony learning experiences, agritours, would that be considered or could it be considered a, an arm of the economic development uh, committee that Florence referred to earlier saying, you know, let's have this ready with terms of reference, ready to, you know, wheel to the pavement right after the next election. And as an arm of the economic development committee, that would be one focus of an economic development plan. I'm not certain if that's a question or if it's a comment or if it dovetails into what Florence says or if it's, if you just wanna move on to another question. No, I think that's a really valid point. And as we look at scoping and where things fit and who becomes responsible for what, um, you know, as originally this was, a, if I recall, an Ag ECDEV committee, and then it was an ECDEV committee, and now it's a community development committee, all of which have similarities. And so when you look at the terms of reference and scoping the work of that committee, agriculture can most definitely be a focus. And your focus might be promoting ACW as a place where urban and rural meets and facilitating the education of our more urban um, neighbors and our seasonal residents um, who tend to be urban as well. So th those are really good comments, Anita, about how we can scope this and organize it um, under, under the committee. Now I have highlighted the Reconnect Ontario because that's a grant. Um, it's an opportunity right now to get people back out and about uh, enjoying tourism because since the pandemic, and I don't know what the deadlines are, but I'm absolutely certain Jen is, uh, gonna, is gonna know that. And Jen, you're the next on our list for comments. Great. I will preface this to say that uh, that deadline is February 3rd. Um, I have already connected with the regional advisor for this grant to say, Boy, that's 20% when we're a rural area and we don't have any of these things. And uh, I've also reached out to Godridge Tourism because they do have it established. Um, so no, don't, Florence, you're, you're bang on. That was, that was my big picture. I've spoken to Kingsbridge about it saying this would be a lot of work and it's actually, it doesn't really, in long, long term, it might do great things for Kingsbridge, but you know, short term, no, but I think the municipality needs to be doing this to help our producers. So I, I think Florence is right from a staffing perspective. And as our mayor likes to say, we're the who or the what or the how or the staff does the whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> that was my ideas. And I'm happy that you have uh, ways to come at it. But uh, as far as the Reconnect Ontario for, for Kingsbridge, um, it, it will happen. Uh, the grant will, whether or not whatever staff can pull off. We're also going to partner with Goddard's Tourism and Huron County Museum and things like that. Um, I, I have established partners. I just think um, long term, this this is the way to help our agriculture. And I'm, I'm delighted with uh, both Councillor Snowblin's comments about it being an arm or part of the agricultural arm and staff's comments. And Jen, may I ask, um, forgive me, I don't, I'm 
I don't have the details on the program in front of me, but is this, um, it, the application's due on February 3rd, but do you have more than this year to deliver on no. what you want to do? It's, no, yeah. and in okay. fact, the application, the application is uh, definitely aimed at tourism and hospitality, getting people out again. The words that I have to write are 44,100 characters, which for those of you who don't write grants, that is 88 single space typed pages. So it is a massive, massive grant. Um, I do have some of it written already, but just such a large portion is based on what you're going to do for your hospitality and tourism is why I reached out to Caitlin and Rick Sickinger because normally when you see that large of a percentage of it means that's what they really want. So um, that's what triggered the thoughts, but it's, it's thoughts that Kingsbridge already had with the SLED grant from 2019 or 20, whatever year it was. So I think it's the way to go for the municipality. So I don't want decisions to be made here based on Kingsbridge's Reconnect Ontario grant, but that is the one that got me thinking about it all. Perfect, great. Um, any other comments as we look at these sort of outward facing educational opportunities? As we move to the next couple, they, I'm, I'll get you to scope them for me, but to me, they look like um, looking at what others are doing. So AC, no, AC I, I, I don't know if you can't see my hand, but I've been oh. waving it until it's tired. So I'm um, so sorry, Bill. No, I couldn't see your hand. So thank you for speaking up. Okay, well, I just wanted to bring something up and I don't know if this is the place for it or not, but um, you learn from other people. We were down a few years ago in the Sparta area and um, what they do down there, and I thought it was a very good idea, is that, um, and I guess you could call me urban at that time because I was on a, a, you know, doing a tourist thing. And so you stop and they give you a pamphlet. And in that pamphlet, it says, okay, if you drive out to here, uh, Joe Blow sells honey. Then you go down, down the road, they take you all through the municipality and all these stops are on there. So then they would maybe take you to the coffee shop over by Kingsbridge. Uh, then they bring you back to uh, Robison's and St. Helens and buy some maple syrup. And um, so, and all these people put into the, say the municipality or whoever's looking after this and says, here's what I can supply. And then, so you make this little map up and all the urban people can get this, do a drive through the community, pick up some uh, local grown produce and uh, they're all happy. Now, I know that couldn't happen right away, but it's something that would be nice if everybody was in favor of it to have it in the future. That's great. And so just a little tip. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen and, it's, and you can see raise your hand, if you click on that, your picture will actually come up to the very top corner of my screen and then I see you. Um, if you just wa okay. wave your hand, I can only see, see six people at a time. So I'm sorry, my apologies. I should have mentioned that at the very start. That's the fastest way to get my attention. And so um, further to Councillor Van Stone's comment, agri-tour maps um, can be both hard copy pamphlet and online. So you can have a digital version as well. And uh, Perth County also offers quite a good agri-tour map if you want to check that out. Um, Florence, your hand is up. Um, you're muted, Florence. So just to kind of pull on what Bill was saying, Vicki, if you wouldn't mind reiterating the idea that was shared about the G2G -G trail uh, the other day that you had mentioned, I think that would be a really interesting uh, topic of conversation for this group. Okay, so when we were um, conversing about uh, the remaining items, what we could do, what could possibly be in scope, and, and also how we can kind of COVID proof uh, some of the overall objectives of educating people more about agriculture in Huron County. We talked about being able to put or looking to put um, agricultural education elements along the G2G trail. So the usership on the G2G trail has um, gone up exponentially during the pandemic. And as people bike along that trail and they're not necessarily from the agricultural area, there's really great opportunities to educate them about what they're seeing along the trail, what they can anticipate to see along the trail. So even 
crop identification, like this is a field of soybeans. And did you know it's one of Huron County's number one exports and that it goes to England and that it comprises, it's a very large percent and forgive me, I don't know the percent right now, but say 75% of the baked beans consumed in England. And so having those kinds of signage and education pieces, taking the education to where the people are currently gathering safely, that was one of the things we talked about. And then there was also mention of highlighting some of the um, historic villages. So, you know, at this used to be the place where, and forgive me, Florence, I can't remember the name, but this used to be the place where um, patrons would ship their milk and then it would be shipped on into Godridge. Um, so Florence, help me with the name of that uh, historic community. Uh, it's it's McGaw. So I'm thinking of the of the old train station down at Brinley Transport on the G to G Trail. So there's already a little sign there, but having something you know broader that when people have their stops, you know they stop for their drink or their water, they can you know this is a, a scheduled stop on the on the trail, and here's some information that gives you a bit of context as to where you are. You could add historic pictures or, you know, you could advance the idea down the road that you scanned a QR code and it gave you more history that you could keep up to date instead of a fixed, um, a fixed sign. So as crops changed, you could kind of change the sign or the information based on uh, what was being grown and then highlight historic events in agriculture as well. So that was just a thought we had. If the overall intent is to educate, and COVID has kept us from gathering, we can take information to where people are gathering in a sense, in a safe way. And it's a way to tell that agricultural story and an element to enhance what you can do down the road. So next we have comments from Councillor Forrester and then Councillor Fisher. Okay, thanks Vicki. This kind of piggybacks on what Bill was getting at. I know here in Kinloss, they do the ice cream trail. I've never done it. I don't know how it works, but you go around to the certain spots and you get a sticker or whatever. So maybe that's something we, we can look into. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fisher. I love the idea of using the G2G trail as an education spot. But I, I wondered if anybody, I've got this uh, very glossy magazine that came out in my mail and it's all about Central Huron. It's quite, it's the size of a magazine. I just think it's interesting. Um, I don't know how they did it and I don't know if anybody else received it, but it's just, uh, I see what they're, it's a tool for them. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Fisher. So I'll note that um, staff could reach out to Angela Smith, who is their, um, community information coordinator, but also ECDEV. And uh, Councillor Snowballin. Thanks, Vicki. And just to piggyback on what a lot of folks have already said, I think this is so crucial. I think this is so vital, um, this, this, this idea, um, whether it's through ECDEV or, or reaching trying to make people more aware of our municipality. Um, there's competition out there for tourism dollars. And we're so fortunate to live in a, in a very touristy area. And I'll, uh, and I'll say Goderich and King Carden, you know, <laughs> uh, anywhere along the lakefront. And um, we all, I think we need to be aware and, and cognizant that tourism dollars only go so far and you have to promote what you have. And I think uh, this, this idea, all the ideas that are flowing in here today are overwhelming and I love, I just love how this is the direction this is going. Wonderful, thank you, Councillor Snowballin. Um, I just, we'll go to Jen next. Nope, you're muted again, Jen. I always put my hand down, but don't start talking. Okay, no comments, please, Peanut Gallery. Um, I did send this to staff, most of staff and the um, council, not to you, Vicki, but I'm sure you know about it because it was at highlighted at the Municipal Agricultural Forum, the York.ca's Agriculture and Agri-Food Sector Strategy. 
Uh, it's uh, 15 items and 45 strategic plan things uh, for agriculture. And I think um, a great resource for when we do whatever, I think it was Florence said, an agricultural arm or specific strategic. I think that our agricultural arm needs to be much more fleshed out than it is. And there's some really great ideas. Um, and in that document includes the one before uh, or the one below about there's funding opportunities. There's, there's a lot of different uh, portions of that. And uh, I know that York is a large region as opposed to a lower tier, but there's lots we could use from that document. And, uh, you know, today's not the day, but I think we should be aiming for something like that. That's a really good objective for the committee once it's formed. And, and I put in the notes that the person you would like to speak to at York is Mina Hassan Ali. She's their lead on the development of that um, multifaceted uh, agricultural um, strategy. Uh, and she is, um, really open to sharing and discussion and conversation. Also, the um, OMAFRA lead for York Region at this time, uh, although there's lots of changes at OMAFRA, is uh, Carolyn Cooter Bo. I think that's spelled correctly. Um, and she's the OMAFRA Arita, the position that I used to hold but that covers the York region. So I put both of their names into your document um, so that you have that there. Um, the other thing that staff and Cole and I discussed the other day when we were preparing um, to the along the G2G trail uh, was also the idea of agritourism going into local businesses has potentially changed dramatically because of the pandemic. So there's always um, food safety concerns, there's always safety concerns taking people into businesses, and now we have that sort of shyness around gathering. So again, looking at what other jurisdictions are doing and an opportunity in a way to promote that education about what our businesses are doing might be to look at videos. And so Perth County has done a series of videos. Um, initially, the the objective was to educate Perth about or, sorry Perth youth about different opportunities and what the businesses looked like inside without actually having to do tours. So Prosper in Perth is the name of the um, overall project that they've done, and so they have created videos that you can find on the county website, or if you Google Prosper in Perth, you'll find them. And they did things like they went into noon industries, for example. Um, an agricultural business along the value chain. And they interviewed different youth in their workspaces to talk about noon industries high, um, employ engineers, they employ accountants, they employ metal fabricators and welders. And so they interviewed the youth, but in the video opportunity, you got to see the workings in the actual business. So it was like taking a tour of the business. So there are ways again to sort of COVID proof um, some of the, those types of opportunities you want to do. And they have done, I believe, three or four videos each year for three years. Interestingly, too, they also wrapped the videos and um, some other curriculum pieces together and offered them to the high schools so that they could take a look at the agricultural industry and they featured also the manufacturing industry to help youth understand what opportunities were available within their own communities. And so the youth were exposed to these tours um, in their grade 10 careers classes. Um, and it really helped because we, when we talked to career counselors or we talked to counselors at high schools, they said the biggest challenge with taking kids on tours was actually getting permission slips. So they'd book a bus and only 50% of the kids would turn in their permission slips. And so they'd go with a half empty bus and the um, employers would have spent a lot of time getting ready for the tour. So there are other ways to look at doing those sort of local business tours. So I'll just note um, Prosper in Perth for you to take a look at if you're interested. Jen, I think your hand was up. 
sorry, no, a piece of furnace just was walking by and I was <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're so happy for you. <laughs> So in our overall conversations, we've now looked at um, the first element of themed events that would rotate, options for agri-tours, pursuing learning experiences in other municipalities. So there's been some really great offerings there as close as here in Kinloss and then also um, Sparta uh, and York region. And then we still um, learn from other communities on how to lend expertise, find funding for small enterprises, and publicize community and rural efforts as rural economic development. Now, you did speak to the fact that communication has gone up. And have, have you been communicating um, around this idea of community and rural efforts as rural economic development? Not yet. OK, so there's room there. Um, but again, these would be items that I think we could uh, put on the agenda of the future committee, going back to Florence's original suggestion um, back here that uh, the staff suggests preparing the terms of reference, the purpose of the committee, um, and some of those basic foundational pieces so that you can move forward with a committee and their goals and strategies in the new term. Jen. I, I think I'd like to ask Florence about a comment she made earlier about um, amending the social something policy to include promoting these events or something, you said something like that. So I guess my question is if, if, if COVID slows down and these, our communities start having these events like Kingsbridge does reconnect and Dungannon has a farmer's market is it in our social media policy that that ACW could promote our community events as they come live or whatever? Is that something that would need to be done in this document we're doing now? So um, we have a social media policy in place that directs what can and cannot be uh, promoted by the municipality. It, it basically ensures that you know a private business can't request that we promote their sale item for the week. Um, so we have um, kind of put some parameters around it. Forgive me, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't exactly say what it does, um, but we can definitely look at that document to ensure uh, and bring it back to council that we would promote um, more um, community-based events, you know, hosted by non-for-profits or, you know, we can work at that language. So that's, that's where that conversation, that comment came from. I'd also like to mention that there is a project underway and it's actually coming along quite nicely. And Huron County is looking at a events calendar um, and Rick Sickinger is working on this so he can definitely give you more details than I. But the concept is that using a similar platform, the Huron County events calendar can pull events from all of the partner municipality calendars and then share what's going on across the county on any given day or especially weekend um, and in the summer during the tourist season. And so this has been a project that's been going on for a little while. In fact, it was first requested when way back when uh, Roger spoke about the uh, st strategic planning uh, train the trainer um, event that we had six years ago. And so it is actually coming to fruition. Um, and should you like more information, I can certainly get more information on that for you. But that, that, is, that calendar is closer to being live and being able to pull events from your own individual, um, our partner municipalities to be able to advertise across in one place what's going on. So Anita and then Jen. Thanks, Vicki. Can I just circle back for a second when you were talking about, um, you know, some high school students, I, just kind of everything being put out there and maybe this was sort of your underlying message, but I see partnerships with um, perhaps the high schools in terms of communications, you know, mm -hmm. uh, communication students doing videos as part of their, you know, project 
project um, or a, a work project or a co-op student or or something along that line. I, I see the opportunity for partnerships in in that regard, but I don't know if that's where you were were you thinking on that vein as well. Um, I'm always very interested in partnering with the youth in our communities. Statistics show that if youth feel that they have a voice and they're involved and they have a say um, in their community as they're growing up, they're exponentially more likely to return to that community to build their life and their career and raise their family. So anytime we can have a meaningful experience for our youth where they feel like they're contributing we're actually doing community development and workforce development. And, and just further to that, when we, we hire summer students, I know that staff uh, are very appreciative to have summer students that are able to um, contribute and assist in the sort of day-to-day -day office. Um, but it maybe would be something to look at to have a, a summer student that is maybe college or university studying communications that would um, be interested in, in um, partnering with Caitlin and, and uh, promoting again through videos and so on. And I see Caitlin's hand is up, so maybe she needs to piggyback on some of my comments. Caitlin, and then Jen. Okay, my comment was around the social media policy. I just pulled it up and basically if it's any organization, um, that is funded or organized by any level of government or um, council approves that we share their content, we don't need to amend our current social media policy to share community events. Um, and then to piggyback on your calendar, we also have a community calendar on the ACW website where mm -hmm. community groups can submit their events to me. Uh, most recently, I think in Dungannon, we did the Christmas market. Um, it was shared on our community calendar and was on our homepage of our website leading up to the event. Um, I also really appreciate uh, Councillor Anita's comment on using a summer student with communications or marketing expertise. I think we could do a lot with them in the summer. Uh, we tailor what our summer student does kind of around what they're doing in school. So if we have an accounting student, they'll work more in the Treasury Department. And if we got an application of someone in marketing or communications, we would use their interest and tools to our best use for the summer. Terrific, thank you very much, Caitlin. And Caitlin, have you connected with Rick on the calendar project? Yes, I've talked to Rick about the calendar. Fantastic, thank you. And Jen. Uh, I have my fingers up trying to remember my points because I'm snuggled under a blanket, not at a desk anymore. Um, <laughs> We're glad you're keeping warm. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say I was. My feet are freezing and so is my nose. Um, <laughs> the uh, Anita's comments about students is excellent. I would just like to add the timing thing because I have partnered with GDCI before on behalf of the municipality in our, my last term. If, if the plan isn't to them by May or June, it can't, it doesn't happen in the next year because they already have their curriculum planned and their projects planned. And it's really difficult on the teacher to say, okay, can you work this into it? So if, you know, just the, the, the timing on that is, a, is a, you know, six months ahead of it, even if it's a January class, they have it planned over the summer. Um, the second thing was the Huron County calendar. I think uh, having tried to work with that monstrosity for the last <laughs> seven years, uh, it, it, there's two difficulties. One is you're gonna need to uh, rebrand it because it was so terrible for so long. And two, the fact that you're getting the, um, uh, the information from the municipality, I think is key because um, there was, uh, I guess, staffing difficulties, which they didn't, promote with the calendar so you were trying to upload things and finally after weeks I called and they said well we actually don't have anyone staffing it right now which means then it's not very relevant right so I understand why it happened but um, not many people use that for that reason and I forget my third point I had three fingers if I think of it I'll, I'll say it later <laughs> perfect thank you very much Jen and I did note those points um, 
Okay, so does anyone want to make any further comments about any of our agricultural um, goals and actions? I think we've done a pretty good job um, of addressing them, learning from other communities and how to lend expertise and find funding for small business enterprises. I think we've got some really good examples here with York Region, um, Sparta area, um, Central Hurons Magazine, um, some of Perth County's work. And again, um, if we're looking for something specific, then you know um, we can reach out through our networks and I'm happy to help you find some of those networks as well. Having worked at the provincial level, I do have some of those networks. Um, but I think Jen is probably one of the most networked persons um, that I know. So you're in pretty good hands. So last but not least, we have the human resources um, objective of training and education. Now, when we spoke about this, this is the one where I said we really have, been, you really have been doing the most that you can do. Um, you've done some great transfer of knowledge amongst staff. Uh, mandatory training has taken, taken place. And where staff felt that you might have um, missed some opportunities are in those um, conference type situations where we weren't able to attend in person. And, you know, two full days uh, online is tough. It is tough to pay attention um, for that amount of time. Did we want to look at this or do we want to consider this in progress and under control? Jen. In progress, under control. We'll do what we can during COVID, but nobody wants to do in person. And like you said, this is our our council's third all day Zoom meeting this week. So, uh, exactly. Many of them. Terrific. And Councillor Snowblin. Uh, it. This is something um, that I've I've given some thought to, and I'm not certain if it would be appropriate to bring it under this and and I'm I'm not certain how welcomed or or um it, it would be by both administration staff and um and council but I'll, I'll I'll just throw it out there um I was involved in another board um, previously and one of the exercises that we did on an annual basis was something that we called a fireside chat and I don't know how it would work with online. I think it's better in person, but I see that day approaching, <laughs> hopefully soon. Um, but I'll, I'll put it out there for people to, to sort of wrap their head around. And, and what the premise of a fireside chat was, is that it was the chief administrator and I'm not certain in our case that that would be Mark or if that would be Florence because Florence is our clerk and Mark is our deputy clerk, although Mark is our CAO. And just the counselors, no other staff. And the other premise behind this was that nothing was off limits to talk about. And that could be anything from uh, comments by a resident, it could be concerns um, about a staff member, it could be um, about a policy. The idea was that there was nothing that was off limits to talk about, but it was also done in a very respectful and uh, progressive sort of fashion. And you couldn't say your comments unless you could say them in a respectful manner. I don't know if, um, I'm just throwing it out there, uh, putting my toe in the water with this. I'm not certain that if this council is uh, interested in something like that or feels the need for something like that. And I think the idea was that it would be in a, in a somewhat safe environment. So it was always, um, like I said, a safe environment where it wasn't talked about in a public forum and where residents or other staff members could uh, grasp and maybe um, 
not fully understand where that counselor might be coming from. Uh, again, I'm just toe in the water. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, Counselor. Um, Deputy Mayor and then uh, CAO Becker, please. So Roger, please go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, I very much would love to see what uh, Anita has been suggesting happen. My fear is there's no way to do it under the uh, Section 239 of the Municipal Act that, that uh, permits closed sessions. Maybe Mark can add to that. I was, I was just going to say the same thing. You just can't go into a council meeting. Uh, first of all, it is a council meeting. Anytime council members are all together, it's classified as a council meeting. So you have to be very careful. There's not very many things that you can go into a camera. And I think what you're talking about would not be allowed in the municipal act. If there's any issues moving forward with anything like that, I don't know what's on your mind, but if it wasn't anything, by all means, you can reach out to me and we can add to agenda or speak to Glenn on it. Thank you very much, Mark and uh, Roger, for those comments. They, there are definitely limitations on the Municipal Act. And so um, I think what's maybe important if you want to look at this idea is what is the essence? What does this allow you to do? And is there a way to fit it under the Municipal Act? And so um, taking a bit of time for a bit further thought as to what is it we what is the um, what's the end result we want to achieve? What what would this allow us that a council meeting wouldn't? And I can think of things right off the top of my head, so I understand where you're going, Councillor Snowblin. And so to reach that same end point, is there an allowable process or vehicle that we can use to get there? Um, so I'll leave it here. It, it's that toe in the water. It's the, you know, so what do we really want to get? Um, we'll set it there. Um, I've noted uh, that the Municipal Act may not, will not allow that version, um, but what is it you want to achieve? And is there another way to do that and still fit within the regulations that bind your activities? Okay. Um, Jen, did your hand go up or was it another piece of the furnace going by? Yeah, and they let the dogs in. I had to go let them in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, are there any other comments at this time about any of the individual um, activities or suggestions that we have in front of us? Okay, so we are at. 10.42, so we're about 20 minutes um, before our scheduled break time. We have a couple of options. We can move forward to prioritization. Um, we can, I can save this document, send it to Caitlin, and she can send it to you, and we can actually take our break right now, um, and we can determine what time you want to return. So if we were leaving now, um, you know, would you like to come back at, would you like to take your break until noon and come back at noon to finish the rest of our afternoon agenda? Um, so I'm offering a couple of suggestions there of what we could do. We could power on. Um, there's been a lot of great activity and thought. If you want to keep that going, we can continue to work till 11 or slightly after. Um, I'm, op I'm opening the floor to what you might like to do. Jen. Yeah, I would love to have this in paper in front of me. If we could, I don't care if we have a shorter break or whatever, if you want to send it to Caitlin and send it, I would print it off. I do better with that. Plus my nose and my toes are really cold and I need a few more layers. So even if we took a short break, if everybody wants to come back, but I do need a break. Okay. Um, so other opinions? I see Councillor Fisher nodding. Um, what I see Deputy Mayor in agreement to that. Here's what I would suggest. I will now save the changes to the document. I will email it to Caitlin, who will then distribute it directly to each of you so that you can sort of take some time and digest. If we took 
an hour and 15 minutes. We would be back at noon. If you wanted longer, we could come back at 1230 as originally scheduled. Um, and then we'll work through our afternoon agenda would be um, prioritizing what we feel we can accomplish. And we've already talked about this. So the whole agricultural chunk, we've talked about get that committee set up um, and get it scoped and ready to go. Uh, you might wanna look at um, some of the other, those items and some of the other items and decide if there's something you feel is possible to accomplish in the next nine months. Um, and then we'll look at moving forward what the next steps are on those pieces. Um, so I guess at this point, Jen? Yeah, just a question. Um, I know the mayor had to leave. Was he planning on coming back at that specific time? Because if he is, we might want to keep that in mind. I guess staff would know that. Um, staff would know that, or we could message him and let him know. Florence? My suggestion would be to come back at 1230. Um, as, as proposed, um, and that way Glenn knows what time he's got to be back, and that gives everybody a good enough time to maybe, I know we're not going out for a walk today, but have a good break, have some lunch, um, breathe out, and then come back refreshed. Okay. I have uh, a text message from Glenn earlier asking me to chair the meeting while he's gone, but uh, things are going great. I'm, I'm doing a wonderful job. You're doing a great job, Roger. <laughs> just great. We love it. <laughs> okay, um, so can we just see a show of hands? Is everybody good with back at 1230? Gives you some time to digest the information, stretch your legs, replenish, fuel up, and warm up in Jen's case. Okay, um, I'll send that through to Caitlin right now. She'll distribute it to you, and we will rejoin at 1230 to continue our agenda. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your participation this morning, and we'll see you this afternoon. Welcome back. Thank you for uh, all your hard work this morning and your great ideas. And so now we're at the portion of our agenda where we start to evaluate our priorities. Now, um, we did prepare an ease and impact graph for you to look at, which might as assist you with your conversation, but your conversation was so lively this, this morning I am kind of tempted to just open it back up to the floor after I do a little bit of a summary for you. So Cole will bring up the ease and impact graph if you want. And uh, just to remind you that it's a way of looking at priorities. So along the um, X axis, we would have the ease of impl implementing a project. Along the Y, we would have the overall impact. So what we're looking for is a situation where we have a high impact that's pretty easy to achieve. What we want to avoid is something that's really difficult to implement, takes a lot of resources, takes a lot of st staff time that we may not have the capacity for, and doesn't have much impact. So we want to sort of avoid that lower right-hand quadrant. So I, I was a bit limited in colors, but the green is what we want to go with. The orange is more like our yellow. It takes a little more work, but the impact is still high. And then low impact um, that's easy or low impact that's hard. We're not necessarily wanting to devote resources to that. So this is one way that we can kind of assess um, the projects that we've talked about and looked at in that chart of what we could do next. Uh, or we can just have a round table discussion. So what I wanted to, to highlight for you from this morning, um, and you, uh, you did all receive the chart from Caitlin. Okay, great. Um, there's the one project in, or there's the one uh, goal in community development of beautification of vacant buildings. The, in summary, the conversation was, this is organically moving along nicely, but there is opportunity to have a discussion with planners to see if maybe where commercial buildings are being used um, with as residences, if there's some opportunity to discuss what that zoning could look like, with the caution that if we change those buildings to purely residential zoning, uh, and the and with the um, surge in people wanting to live in rural areas, 
if the area develops and people actually want to bring back commercial activities, can we go back to that commercial zoning? Or are we sitting with just um, residential zoning and we can't change that? So downtowns ebb and flow. And so we have situations where we kind of lose our downtowns. And we saw that um, in the past, we saw that with the um, rise of subdivisions and shopping malls, our downtowns took a hit. And then lately we've seen our downtowns come back again, sort of in the last decade or so, we've seen a resurgence and vibrancy of downtown. So the planning conversation is an interesting one to have considering all the different parameters. And of course, with the vision of this council and the understanding that economic development is a long-term game, it's important to remember that. So under community development, we're looking at that discussion and possibly just letting them grow organically, okay? Under agriculture, um, there was a strong sense that it would be great to start to prepare that community economic development um, or community development committee and get all the good cornerstone and foundation pieces in place. So terms of reference, strongly stated purpose, and start to scope what kind of membership you'd like or representation. So do you want representation from your key sectors? Do you also want to have a youth representative on your group? Um, do you want not-for-profits represented on your group or key organizations throughout your, uh, your municipality? So working on that scoping project, looking to actually launch the work of the committee uh, in late 2022 and into 2023 when the new council has been sworn in at that time. Uh, then moving forward, we talked about some education projects. So we looked at um, providing education around agriculture and what it means to ACW, looking at uh, in possibly um, COVID proofing some of the ideas by making taking education pieces to where people are safely gathering at this time or not necessarily gathering, but along the G2G -G trail. So usership is up. Can we reach out to the people where they are instead of inviting them to gather? We also looked at what other communities are doing um, to support agriculture and community development and to communicate that message. We also looked at instead of business tours, is there an opportunity to do videos and create content to highlight and show off our businesses. So a number of different projects um, that could fall under this committee work. So I think the discussion here is really, what are your favorite projects? And did you want to start any of them this year? So again, there was conversation about looking for possibly a communications and marketing post-secondary student who could work on some of the storytelling or some of the planning for those communication pieces um, to highlight agriculture and community development in ACW. There was also a topic around what other people are doing. So I would call this research and development. So looking at, um, I believe Councillor Van Stone talked to us about, about the ag map in Sparta um, and other ag maps, what people are doing around that kind of work and doing further investigations in regions like York Region um, to see what they're doing around their ag economic development and some of those priorities. And then I do believe that the very last topic, um, human resources, training and education, I believe it was the sense of everyone in the meeting that we are actually on the right track there and that when things open up more, there will be a few more opportunities, but it was felt that that was really kind of taken care of at this point. And so it will evolve as things reopen and we can uh, attend more opportunities, but we certain, that certainly is in progress. Does that seem like a reasonable highlight of uh, what we talked about? Okay, so, um, what I would probably suggest at this point is we can um, we can go around we can go around the group and you can tell us what you feel your top priority is out of what was discussed this morning. 
Um, or we can bring up the ease and impact matrix and Cole can place sticky notes of your priorities where they would fit or what's most important to you and where they would fit on that graph. What's easy, what's impactful? Um, would you prefer to use the graph or would you prefer to just have a conversation and we can take notes? Jen and then Roger. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I like conversations, but I'm happy to defer to what everybody else wants. Roger? I'm quite comfortable with the, con with the conversation. Uh, I've got a couple Great. of things I want to push forward, so. Terrific. I like the idea of the conversation because then I can see all your faces and I won't miss any hands. And I, I really would like to hear from everyone. So when you're all on the screen, we can just go around and make sure that we hear from everyone about what's most important to them. And then I'll ask um, Cole, uh, Cole and Caitlin will probably be taking some notes and then we can look at prioritizing um, our final results uh, from there. Does that sound good? Okay, um, Roger, you're in the top left hand corner of my screen. Let's start with you. Oh, goody. Uh, two things under the community development and beautification and uh, zoning issue. I really want to see us push forward on exploring some kind of mixed commercial residential zoning for that strip along Main Street, because I think we need to do the same darn thing for the strip of land on the south side of Airport Road for the chunk of land we're considering rezoning residential. I think it's important for both of them to enable commercial to exist in a residential, otherwise residential area. Great. And did oh, you the other one was uh, moving forward with the uh, the effort that uh, Florence mentioned, uh, having primed to go in the, the new administration. Wonderful. So we'll call that committee development. Terrific. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and that, and those were your two top priorities. Perfect. And you're not limited to two. If you want to share more, that's fine as well. Um, My brain doesn't think fast enough. <laughs> well, if you have another as we go around, you can just put up your hand and say, I like that one too, or make another suggestion, okay? Uh, Councillor Forster, would you like to share what you feel are your priorities? Okay, one of my priorities would be getting a farmer's market going in Dungannon at the gazebo and I concur with Roger that we need to, well, it's one way to beautify Dungannon is let them live in the residential area or the commercial areas of that area. So those are two of my concerns. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to Councillor Fisher, please. Um, housing still is a big issue for, in my mind, and it, we just finished our Roma conference and it was huge in the Roma conference too. It's huge across the whole province. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing a lot of development. There will be a lot of houses built. They're not affordable houses. They're probably not even attainable houses. So I want to know, like I want us to be able to work some of that into these developments. And I don't think we shouldn't, you know, we should be able to do that. Great. I don't know where that falls. I'm going to put that under community development. It is tied into that commercial residential conversation, um, but it also open. It also leaves the opportunity to moving forward, continue that attainable housing conversation or density or mixed use kind of conversation. Does that work? Yes, and I agree with with uh, Roger's points. Actually, with everything that's been said ahead of me. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Councillor Fisher. Uh, Councillor Snowballin. Uh, thank you. I, I would say that if I had a priority, it would be um, kickstarting the economic development uh, that we talked about um, when Florence was saying, you know, sort of get it um, ready to rock and roll uh, right after the election in terms of with the terms of reference and so on. And, uh, and one other thing, I guess, under that umbrella, um, there's been interest by developers 
uh, in our municipality. And I would like to see another branch off of that economic development tree to focus on uh, growth, um, housing growth, um, tied into the economic development somehow. Great. So if we were looking at a subcommittee model, then so far there is interest in ag, ag education, and then the housing um, and, and, and growth around residential units. Correct, correct. Yeah. Yes, and back to Councillor Fisher. I just had a memory of uh, in the Roma conference, they mentioned more than once that uh, housing is economic development. They yes, tie together. Yeah, for sure. When we need workforce, um, we need a place for them to live. But beyond that, when we look at our community development, rural areas really run on volunteers. And so we need people. And again, we have succession planning issues with our volunteers. They're aging out. Um, they're overextended and exhausted. When you attend board meetings or look at organizations, you will see the same faces popping up. So um, that recruitment effort, it, we, we need a base of people to recruit from and they need homes to live in. So yeah, it's all tied together. Terrific. Um, Councillor Snowblin, did you have any more comments before we move along? along? Um, to, Clor to Gloria's point about the, um, the attainable housing, um, I, I, I'm aware of a, of a, a community I'm going back into probably the late 80s, early 90s that did what was called, I think was called co-op housing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was um, subsidized. I'm not aware that there are any other programs like that. Um, and I'm sure at Roma, they would have mentioned something along that line. But I'd be curious to know if um, staff are able to get more information on something like that. And it was all sort of, a, it was kind of a gear to income and it was like townhouse. And uh, I believe it was called co-op housing and you had a co-op board and so on. I don't know, do you know what I'm talking about, Vicki? Yeah, I do. And there are actually still some good examples of those um, cooperative housing developments in Kitchener Waterloo. Um, so we could look to gain some more information by um, accessing uh, having a conversation with those that are still in existence. And you're right that it was sort of a big push at one time. It kind of fell off. Um, definitely pros and cons, challenges, but there are some longstanding ones that I am aware of in KW or that I could access uh, more information on or give a uh, referral to. Um, Councillor Forster followed by Deputy Mayor Watt. Okay, thank you. Um, Anita, when I was at the Roma thing, it's called Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the subsidized housing that I saw on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Deputy Mayor Watt. Thank you. I was going to mention the same thing. Uh, I managed to get to that session too, and there were three speakers all talking about innovative approaches to uh, better housing for, uh, for less money. And one of the things that struck me because it came up during one of the panel sessions was the Sandra Weaver commented that in Huron County, we're looking at things like tiny houses as second residences. I think that's, it struck me that that's very short-sighted. I think we need to make sure that our official plan and our zoning bylaws don't freeze out the possibility of small footprint structures as primary residences as well. that session I did and I found it fascinating. Jen did, Lori did. Okay, great. Um, so just to give you a little bit of, um, just to let you know some of the things that are going on in the county, there is a housing renewal study right now. And so one of uh, my team members who is off on maternity leave, her um, FTE allotment has been devoted specifically to a housing renewal study that's being led by planning, but um, ECDEV is highly involved with that. So looking at um, a number of different strategies. So that work is ongoing. 
Um, the, there is a tiny house presentation in February to the ECDEV board. So if any of you would like to hear that, it's on the agenda for February the 9th. Um, and again, we will hear, uh, uh, there'll be an introduction to a presentation um, given by Denise Van Amersport um, prior to a presentation by Cabinscape. And we are going to, with the board, we'll be looking at um, modular homes, tiny homes, and alternative approaches to housing over the course of the next couple of um, meetings of the Economic Development Board. So um, for those of you who didn't get to attend the Roma session, the videos of those sessions are up for the next 30 days for participants. And I would never want to rip off Roma by sharing um, their intellectual property and not having registered, but if by chance you shared your credentials, somebody could look up those presentations. Um, those presentations were very thought provoking. And so uh, we're just in the midst of sharing some of that information in our internal conversations. And we, we may look to bring some of those speakers to come and speak to us. They were very open about coming and talking about their models. So if we do that, if that comes to the ECDEV board, then I will most certainly make sure that you know. And, and as I said, again, um, that is an, an open meeting and there are recorded minutes. So that conversation around the broader scope of tiny homes, modular homes, um, and the housing renewal project are all happening simultaneously. So just so you know that that's going on um, throughout, the, throughout the county at this time, okay? Um, so we are moving right along to Councillor Van Stone, please. Um, thank you. Um, my, my main one would be to get the committee in place for um, next year and have it functional because um, as they said, we got nine months left and I don't think with COVID you're gonna get a whole lot accomplished this year. My, I'm sorry to say that, but I think that's true. But if we had that committee in place for next year, um, so the new council could walk in there, put people on it, have, and you say, find volunteers to sit on it. That's going to be a, a job in itself this year. So um, that's going to take time. So that would be my main one. And, and then, as I said, I think we could work with the planning department uh, on a bunch of, uh, you know, zoning and whatnot. So anyways, that's mine. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Van Stone. Uh, moving on to Jen, please, Councillor Miltenberg. Okay, so what I did was I printed off the handy dandy sheets, highlighted what I wanted, tried to put them in categories. So I actually have two main categories and one little one. So the Great. first one is under community development. Uh, absolutely consult with the planner and come back with a staff report. The other thing I wanted to make sure got left in the plan. Uh, kind of alluded to what Wayne said about the farmer's market, because I do think it's progressing well organically. Now, having said that, I did have a meeting with Dungannon last week, and there is no request for funds from ACW, mostly because I encouraged it. I said, you know, we're starting phase three, which is where our first plan was to get the green space. The second one was the gazebo. It didn't get done until the end of December. Our third one is to put in the trees and the benches and beautify it. And we were gonna go to community members and say, okay, would you like to sponsor a tree or a bench? Well, what happens if we don't get all of it? Well, then we actually can't come to um, ACW until our next budget request, which is a year from now. Mm -hmm. But I still said, it's better not to ask if you don't actually know what you're asking for and you don't give the community a, a chance to do it themselves. So let's say they do want to need, um, they want to do a, a, a farmer's market, but they need a startup cost because there's no picnic tables or anything yet. So there's no signage, there's no anything. What if they needed a small amount of money to start? Normally we'd say, okay, that's a budget request. If we keep in mind that we're expecting this to do become organically, and if something can happen in the middle of the year, because COVID had eased, I would like them to be able to come to council to ask for a partnership, even though it's at the wrong time of the year. I've really got it. We've drilled in, it's January 31st. If, if Mark, if you haven't got their budget request, it is done. Someone has forgotten to mail it. Um, 
So I just feel like if we leave it in the plan that we're monitoring it, that it is happening organically, then if it doesn't, then it's still on our radar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was hoping for with the community development piece. Under the agriculture, I'm going to say what everybody's saying, which is the prepare the terms of reference, purpose, ready to go. Because I noticed when I highlighted everything I wanted um, or that I felt we should focus on, it, it's under that umbrella. And a lot of it is partnerships for the ag agitation, the G to G trail, the Kingsbridge, um, the uh, what's the other one that's I highlighted here? Oh, partnerships with secondary schools. Mm -hmm. Because we did have a partnership with the secondary school for an item. So when that was finished, then all the connections and the structure was lost. I think it needs to be part of a larger plan so that you have existing partnerships and you can work together. So I, I, I agree with Bill. I think it needs to be fairly fleshed out before the next election because otherwise they're starting from where we're at and they don't know with all the background work that we've been doing on all these years. So if it's ready to present with all the pillars and the partnerships saying, okay, staff will look into agri-education and, and working with the schools and whatever, I think that that is um, really, really important. I agree with Bill, we, we can't uh, pull it off, but we can get it shovel ready. And then if the next council decides to do nothing, then it's a lot harder for them to do nothing because there's a plan in place, right? Um, the third thing I just wanted to mention was the Reconnect Ontario. I am going to be reaching out to Caitlin to, uh, for just a high level of what the municipality is, is going to be trying to do in, in whatever we come up with today. Because we don't actually have to pull it off because a portion of the grant is also new and innovative, and that is for ACW. So I don't want to put in the grant anything that the municipality doesn't think it's doing, right? So... Either I'll write it and send it to her and say, is that what we said? Or the other way around so that we can include that we're planning to do these things from tourism and hospitality and agriculture in the actual grant. Um, so that's my low level and immediate <laughs> want. And my, my final comment was under <coughs> education. And I, I didn't want to, I wondered what uh, Councillor Snowblin I thought your, your question was really good, Vicki. What, what, what was she, what did the school board, I think that's the organization she was referring to, achieve with the fireside chats or whatever they were called? Like what, what were we hoping to foster in that? Because that interested me, but I, I would like to know the, what you felt you gained from it. Um, what did we gain from it? I guess there was, um sort of a, it built trust, first of all, um, between your, I'll, I'll say CAO or CEO uh, and your elected officials. Um, because everything was confidential, but it was in a very safe environment. Um, so trust was built and also there was some vision as well. So similar to the strategic plan, you may have a vision of what you might like to see your council, your board, your whatever, uh, do in the future. And then those items would go into um, putting together the strategic plan. Um, it also gave insight into more the um, workings of administration uh, for the benefit of counselors or elected officials. So um, I thought that was beneficial too, um, just to know sort of the, uh, the um, organizational chart sort of thing, you know, uh, where everything goes. It was a much bigger organization. Um, it covered a lot more geographic area. Um, and as I said, I, I, I just put it out there and when, um, Roger and Mark suggested that perhaps it would not be able to happen, I guess, under the provincial regulations. I'm, I'm trying to remember how that went, but it might have been under um, training or something like that. I can't, I can't recall. And that's many years ago for me. 
and my memory's not that great sometimes, but, um, and, and I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I just, I just threw it out there and, um, I'm not offended if people don't like it, <laughs> but, um, I just thought it would be a way to maybe foster, uh, relationships, foster trust, um, and, and, uh, foster visionary, uh, elements of the strategic plan. Great, thanks. Uh, Roger? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm one of those people who just absolutely loves the idea, even though if municipal act gets in our way, because to me, the opportunity to sit, to sit around and just shoot the breeze in terms of what bugs you, what turns you on, it leads to all kinds of possibilities for creative synergies that you just cannot get from the routine, mundane council meeting agendas or even the, the planning sessions, mm -hmm. which are a little bit too structured. Mm -hmm. So I hope we can find a way to do something, but uh, I can't see that it fits in any one of the 14 categories where we, we are permitted or required to have closed sessions. Uh, going back to what Jennifer said, uh, I think we can reassure Jennifer that she doesn't need to worry about timing because there's an escape clause at the bottom of our community grants policy that says we reserve the right to award grants outside the scope of the policy at any time. Jen, please. Yeah, I I know that we can, but as you're aware, if you're not, uh, you, you tune me out. It's difficult to get everybody to get their requests in at the right time of the year. And I've just kind of got them doing it. So I don't want to say, oh, we can ask anytime. I'd like to say you're in our strategic plan and we are aware we're trying to do this. So therefore, do you know what I mean? Like it, it's like herding chickens, my own organization included, you know, it really is. Okay. Um, so just, just to summarize, I think that um, Anita, everyone, not everyone, those who have spoken definitely seem to be interested in your idea. And I really like that you could break down for us that what you were looking for were ways to build trust and communication between the CAO and the council members, um, looking for a way to get a better understanding of, I, I noted roles and responsibilities, but kind of how the organization functions. And to me, this all, um, seems like a very appropriate timing for when we onboard our next councils. So a sense of not just ACW, but a sense of the overall county and how that works and, and how to have those conversations for a learning opportunity. And that sort of natural, as you call it, a fireside chat or water cooler conversation, some of our best moments come from that. And through the pandemic, we've really lost that ability to have a quick chat before we sit down in our chairs and start a meeting or stand out in the parking lot and, you know, talk about the inspiration we got at that meeting and what might come from it. So I, you know, I, I don't believe there's a resolution this moment, but now that we understand a little bit better of what you felt that offered, um, you know, I think we can leave it to further discussion, for people to think about, to look at ways that this could be accomplished and still not contravene the Municipal Act. Roger. It just occurs to me that council actually used to have a forum in which that happened. Uh, Mark can comment more on it than I can. Uh, but in my first term, I remember that after council meetings, we regularly adjourned to the break or the lunchroom and had coffee and cookies or other things that people had brought in and just talked about stuff. I don't remember why it collapsed. Uh, maybe Mark does. Yeah, then we, I think we found out that it was illegal. We shouldn't be doing that because it was <laughs> basically classified as another council meeting after a council meeting. So we stopped it and uh, for that reason. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of co councils who um, meet at coffee shops to chat and, and the same thing happened, that they realized they actually had quorum and then it was an official meeting. and. So those conversations had to be ceased in that format. Um, did, uh, were there further comments? Roger, did I see your hand up again? Or Mayor, yeah, please go Thanks, ahead. Becky. If I could uh, contribute a comment, 
I think that we have both an opportunity and a duty with our residents of ACW to increase the communication of awareness of what a municipal council does, what we're responsible for. We are the government closest to the people. And especially in an election year, I think a, a, a raised awareness of what the responsibilities of a municipal council are, what we're responsible for, what the responsibility of the province is, what the responsibility of the federal government is, I believe would assist the connecting with the residents. And I'm a firm believer, as everyone knows, that council's the what and staff is the how. And if we as a council say, yes, we would like to increase the communication with awareness to our residents, then it's up to staff as to how that is done. I think there's an opportunity, and especially at this time, to uh, increase that with our residents. Thank you. Um, so if I may, there is a fairly active group in Gray County, and it's called Elect Her Now, and I believe it's electhernow.ca is their website. And their mandate, as you can tell from the name, is to encourage more female municipal councillors. They're focused on the female level um, of government. And in the last um, round of municipal elections, they actually created a one-page, two-sided document that was really Civics 101. And it said, this is what your federal government does for you. This is what your provincial government does for you. And this is what your municipal government does for you. And they distributed that around Gray County to help the voters really understand what kinds of questions to ask when there was the opportunity to speak to um, people who were running for council, to understand what to expect of their municipal councillors, and to just refresh from grade five or grade 10, which was really the last time, if you're not involved in politics, might have been the last time you were exposed to the makeup of the three levels of government. So um, in an attempt to not recreate the wheel, um, I have spoken, I can't remember her name right now, but I can. I have spoken one of the volunteers who helped create that document, and she said that Elect Her Now is more than happy to share any of those resources broadly beyond the work they do in Gray County. Um, so I will try to find her contact information, um, but I think it's, it's such a beautiful piece, and even if you didn't want to use it exactly the way it is, uh, staff would have a spot to work from that they could go forward. It's so much easier to use a red pen on something that exists than it is to start from scratch. So um, I will look for that contact name, but if you wanted to look at their website, it is elect her now, no spaces, no capitals, and I believe it's .ca. Thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. Um, excuse me, um, everybody. I'm gonna turn my video off. Everybody's frozen, so I'm having internet issues here. That's fine, thank you. Um, did staff want to make any comments with regards to the priorities that council has highlighted at this point? Okay, seeing none. Then what I have in my notes is explore mixed zoning of commercial and residential use, um, specifically thinking of Dungannon. Uh, keep in mind or look at housing development um, around attainable housing. Um, as for the committee, I believe it was every member of council felt that, oh, I'm so sorry, Mayor, I didn't ask for your priorities. Pardon me. Oh, yeah, no, I, I covered that off with the communication with our residents. No, I'm good with that. Thanks, Okay. Vicky. Sorry, thank you. Um, so basically it was the, the idea of getting the groundwork done for the uh, Community Development Committee was basically unanimous. Everyone seemed to be in favor of that. And then under that would fall, looking at what would be the scope of that group. So under that, the suggestions were some of the ag education pieces um, and a housing 
uh, housing growth, attainable housing type strategy under that piece. Um, Caitlin and Cole, did I miss anything as for our top issues? Oh, I'm, my apologies, farmer's markets. Uh, the farmer mar farmer's market in Dungannon was also uh, a noted priority. And I just wanted to comment that um, OMAFRA has a number of farm market resources and they have a farm market specialist who can help a market to get started. Um, and so that is an opportunity for you. And also just around the uh, picnic table and structure conversation, um, that is another way that you could go to the woodworking classes of your local high school. But also I know that um, Launchpad in uh, Gray County, um, they have recently uh, gone out and started to market their woodworking shop and they are selling picnic tables to local municipalities. I know they have orders in North Bruce uh, and around the four county region. Um, and uh, the actual coordinator of that program is Emily Morrison, who I believe is an ACW resident, yes. Morrison Berries. Yes. yes. Um, so she's the coordinator of that program. So, so looking again, um, just a suggestion when you were talking about those picnic tables and local contributions, there's a possibility that if the wood was purchased, a local high school class um, could actually make some of those things for you. So I just wanted to highlight that. So to recap, um, explore zoning for commercial residential use, farmers markets, um, attainable housing, and um, getting the committee a structure set up and thinking about what the membership would look like and getting ready to move forward in the new term of council. So those are really four priorities. Jennifer. Uh, yeah, could you, Vicki, um, send the contact information for the farmer market, how to get it going? Yep. That is on their uh, agenda. And the picnic tables, that's actually exactly what I was referring to. They. Uh, Dungannon raised, I don't know, close to $100,000. They have less than $2,000 left. So there's not actually funds for all the things they need still. And we haven't really priced or looked for anything yet. That's what right. I was referring to. Great. And another good local contact for farmers markets who has been pivotal in starting some of the other markets across Huron County is Joan Brady. Um, and so she's closely aligned with NFU, National Farmers Union. Uh, and so she has helped get other markets started as well. So she would be a good local uh, reference as well. But I will find that um, Omafra, Jessica Kelly comes to mind, but I will find the actual name and contact information from Omafra and send that to you. Okay, great. So you basically have four priorities. Um, one is to reach out to planning. One is to provide resources to the farmer's market in uh, the potential farmer's market in uh, Dungannon to explore attainable housing further and to form the committee. Um, so that work would be turned over to staff at this point. Um, would staff like to discuss that amongst themselves, prioritize and look at how that might work? I think that'd be the perfect way to go proceed, yeah. Terrific. So the next point in our agenda was to look at, um, was to look at the next steps plan. And you've really scoped beautifully down to four main priorities that uh, will involve some research and discussion with your staff. Um, Florence, did you want to speak to that at all? No, I'm happy to, uh, to proceed as council wishes, so. Okay, um, so I would then suggest that our next um, action item is to look at next steps. And I feel that your next steps point directly to staff looking at your four top priorities and deciding how to move forward. Um, we will provide, I will provide those resource names um, after this meeting directly to staff. And is there any further conversation at this point that you would like to have before we look to adjourn? Yes, Deputy Mayor Watt. Thank you. One of the things that came out of the Roma conference in terms of the list of things that struck me and I wrote down 
That's nothing to do with anything we've talked about so far. I don't know. I don't know where it would fit in. But it occurs to me that uh, we have this wonderful statement that acknowledges the traditional lands on which we occupy today, about which personally I know absolutely nothing. And it's hard to demonstrate respect for and cooperation with a governing body about which you know nothing. I have no idea what First Nations are present in, in ACW, uh, who represents them. Uh, I know nothing. And that makes me feel inadequate, and I'd like to change that. Okay. Um, so I think that lends itself to the topic of authenticity, and authenticity is what many of our uh, local tourists are looking for, what tourists are looking for. They want an authentic experience. They don't want the Disney version of any community. And, and so that's where our education pieces around agriculture start to happen. That's where telling the history of ACW starts to happen. And maybe this is a piece that sits in that education component learning more about the First Nation peoples who resided or still reside in ACW, um, more about them, what was important to them, how they lived, how they used the land, um, and offering that in the same way we offer education around our history, our history as settlers and also agriculture. Um, so might I suggest that would be something that the Community Development Committee could look at as part of their education mandate or learning more about ACW, because that's what tourists really want. They want to know the real story and the, the authentic experience of what happened in this area and what continues to happen, both historical and, and moving forward. Does that seem reasonable? Yes, Councillor Fisher, then Milton, Councillor Miltonberg, and then Deputy Mayor. It does sound reasonable. I think another piece of that is to be aware of of our neighbors. Like, what what neighboring First Nations um, bands are around us? Yeah, and who they are, and and because there are several that aren't far from us. So yes, and because so you know about them, I'd like to know more myself. Yes, so First Nations storytelling as well. Councillor Miltonberg. Well, I was about to say, I don't think actually that is reasonable. Uh, simply because we're talking about doing a strategic plan with the education component that's going to happen in 2023. So I don't, I don't think that we need to wait until the next term of council to recognize who we're the indigenous and and all that I would say that would be low hanging right away fruit for me like wh why do we have to make it part of a greater strategic plan why don't we just find out about it and put it up in communications okay so maybe a summer student project to do that research to extend the capacity of staff right now through a summer student doing that research um deputy mayor and then Caitlin thanks I'm I probably should be more interested in the past history than I am, but my immediate concern was the fact that I don't know anything about the current situation. Uh, I've heard staff say from time to time that they've reached out to whoever, I don't know who, on a because there are things where we have to consult. I don't know who we consult with. I don't know anything about them. But when it comes to respecting the, the ways of, of other entities with whom we share the land, uh, I feel just grossly inadequate. Great, wonderful points, all of you. Um, Caitlin and then Councillor Snowblin. Yes, I would just like to share that we do have the land acknowledgement and resources on our website. Uh, so if you go in at residence and then about the community, following um, just a little blurb about ACW, we do acknowledge um, that we are on the traditional territory and what treaties were signed in regards to this land. And then with the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, um, we had staff training on that day that all staff could access. And we did a social media campaign with the treaties and land acknowledgement as well. And Caitlin, do we have, um, do you have the names of the people who, who you, consults with when you want to consult with your First Nations 
residents and partners? Uh, not off the top of my head, but on planning matters, we do reach out to local organizations. Okay, so maybe there's an immediate um, education piece that you could provide to council with who some of those representatives are and how you consult with them and who they represent, um, just as a suggestion. Councillor Snowballin. Thank you. Um, I see where you're going, Vicki, with putting this um, Roger's suggestion and, and this element into that um, community development uh, envelope or pillar or silo, whatever you want to call it. But just to expand on it a little bit, um, we're talking about First Nations and, and traditional territories and so on. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But the larger picture would be the history of the ACW, um, of the three wards and, and uh, I'm even thinking like back to Pioneer, would there be a, an appetite to do um, through volunteers somehow, some kind of a history storytelling? And I hate to say another committee, but I just don't know what other <laughs> uh, vocabulary to use for that, um, that it would, it, it would dive deeper into uh, the history of ACW, which includes the uh, First Nations uh, element and treaties and neighboring First Nations and so on. Um, maybe there's something already in the county that, um, you know, addresses or, or kind of dovetails into this. Um, perhaps, I guess just opening it up for conversation and, and maybe getting Roger's thoughts on that, if, if um, that would uh, help with your concerns. And just another FYI, this kind of discussion would be something that would be at a fireside chat. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. um, so I think that a couple of things are going on here. It's like, what's the fulsome history of ACW? But also currently, right now, what do we know about those peoples who reside amongst us, who we consult with, that are part of the First Nations communities? Um, if I'm scoping that properly. Okay, um, now on to Councillor Forster and then on to CAO Becker. Please. Thank you. Um, I've always wondered why we don't recognize the Indigenous groups that occupied this before we did at the beginning of council meetings. So, okay, thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, Mark. respect to history, we do have history books for the municipalities, all three, uh, West Wallen and Osh and Ashfield and Colburn. I don't know what the details of it, but there are history, uh, history books that have been already been done by our local um, volunteers. So they are available. Wonderful, thank you. And Jen. Uh, yeah, just to, uh, whatever, segue. That's, let's just stop saying pigtail or dog tail, I don't remember what it was. Okay, segue into what everybody else was saying. Mark is correct. I was on uh, the committee of the last one, the East Ashfield history book. Um, it is all in hard cover. Um, I think um, what I'd like to throw out there and not immediate, but in the big picture, I liked Anita's comment about what about the history of, of where we are, not just the indigenous history, and it seems to me that one of the complaints or the concerns or the fears when we got rid of the ward system is that they would lose their history and who they were. And perhaps if we did uh, uh, something permanent on the website where this is how we began and take each ward, what they were like and how they came together and, and incorporated items from all the history is in hardcover. It really is, or soft cover or no cover if somebody's read the book a lot, like at my house. Um, but it is there. And for just a really, you know, an overview of it all, that would be a great, I think, summer student project or something like that. And that would cover your, your big picture. It covers not only the natives, but also the pioneers that are, their descendants are afraid that history is going to be forgotten because we've amalgamated the wards finally or whatever it was we did that upset everyone. And uh, 
I like Wayne's suggestion. We should say something at the beginning of meetings and we should know by what Roger says, why we're saying it. Like really short-term history of what, who are these people and how do you say that really long word that starts with an A? Uh, Roger, please. Thank you. Uh, continuing on the fireside chat, there's one other item that stuck in my brain from the Roma conference that uh, I think we need, we, we could consider. One of the sessions I attended, uh, one of the speakers was talking about a rural change makers program. It's apparently a, a program operated by, through, or in conjunction with the Rural Institute of Ontario to uh, bring together youth and set them free and encourage them to pursue their own ideas for making their communities better. And in terms of community development, I think maybe this is something we might want to have a look at. Uh, so the Rural Changemakers program was launched, well, they had an in-person meeting um, and I consulted on the project at the time. And so it's a really good project. Municipalities could apply to have a student within their community um, doing that change maker work. I believe that South Huron had a student in the first offering. Um, so it will, uh, moving forward, it will depend on ROI's funding to be able to offer that, um, but worthy of more ex exploration. I thought it was a really worthwhile program. It was sort of a, um, it was building leadership in rural Ontario, but not necessarily through the, um, oh, I just lost it, but the ag program that they run. Um, Mayor McNeil helped me. Uh, ROI runs the ELP program, the ELP program, which is also, it's, it's a leadership program for ag. Um, so this was a leadership program for youth and they do this work really, really well. So definitely worth looking at. Uh, Mayor McNeil, your hand is up. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Becky. This is a very interesting discussion we're having. And as Mark alluded to, and, and we're all aware, there, there's books from the respective three municipalities prior to us combining. However, in what form do a proportion of our residents of ACW want to be communicated in? And by that, I mean, there are individuals that embrace those books and will read them cover to cover. When I look at our younger staff, is that the way yourselves and your families, your children, want to learn about ACW? Is there a different way that it can be formatted? And you know, when I look back in history, and when I think of some of the previous Reeves we've had, and the comments they'd make, and you know, to, to have that on record, you know, and I, I think of Russell Kernahan, formerly former Reeve of Colburn Township, and he had a saying that always stuck with me about patience. And, and he said, when it comes to patience, men have none and women have a little. I've never forgot that. And I've commented about that to some of his children and grandchildren. And they said, yeah, I remember grandpa saying that. But things like that, I, I think we can learn a lot from history. However, we have to communicate it in a way that people want to be communicated in that vein, in that vehicle. So that's a fulsome project for our staff to come back to us. If, if it is the sentiment of council, we would like to provide history for our residents going forward. It's up to staff how that would be done. So that's just a comment that I wanted to offer, Vicki. And I think it could fit in that discussion around um, a post-secondary uh, communication and marketing student who could work independently on a project that was scoped by staff. Um, so, you know, that's in some of the conversations we've had so far today, that is something that could be looked at under, under that as one way to look at the delivery. Um, there might also be partner organizations that you could look at uh, the crafting of material and how to deliver that to various audiences. So, um, so shall we put that forward that staff explores what those opportunities might be for telling the history? Jen, as well. 
Yeah, I, I think that this has perhaps gone a little further than I actually intended it. Um, um, and I'll speak from my experience with Kingsbridge. Um, the Huron County Museum will work in partnership to make stories of your, uh, they're looking for stuff north of Godrich basically and to tell the story of the little artifacts and have displays that move around. Uh, we were working with them and then COVID struck, so we're still like waiting for them. They can't take anything in during COVID. What I was thinking of more than a detailed history, which is doable, but I don't think is our role, is more of an overview on the internet, which is a much smaller task and you could probably get easily out of one of the, I mean, I think the books are great. They have an in-depth of every single property, but you could get an, an overview and whether that's working from those books or from somebody who worked on the books, but more to acknowledge on our website that we started this way, but we've come together as one so that people can see that their history is not gonna be forgotten, but that we've moved forward and to give acknowledgement to the, those who came before us, whether they're natives or pioneers or whoever they are. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's where I was talking about more I think it's a, a very worthy ge geologic, ge genealogical, whatever that genealogical. is. Genealogical. Yes. Yeah, sure. uh, but I don't think it's our role. Having worked on the last book, mm, that's a massive, massive project that is, is not in our mandate, I would say. And Councillor Miltonberg raises a really good point is that any great idea needs the appropriate scoping and the investigation around partnerships. Because as we spoke of earlier about, you know, um, everybody's looking level and calm, but after the last two years, the feet are going like this on the duck under the water, or Fred Flintstone is driving his car with real vigor, even though all you sort of see is the calmness above. So we do have to be very mindful um, that everyone is, is working in a bit of a state of exhaustion and scoping projects and being considerate of capacity is really important, but also being considerate of those resources. And when Jen mentioned the museum, that's fantastic. I just wanted to mention that right now they're work, actually working on a First Nations display of ribbon skirts. I think it's a ribbon skirts, Cole. Is that what the conversation was yesterday? So Cole is helping um, one someone from the museum to, uh, assemble a number of stands so that the skirts can be displayed throughout the museum in an upcoming um, curated display in anticipation of the museum reopening. So there is actually a First Nations display coming up. Um, and so they are a wonderful partner to look at some of this exploration. Is it ribbon skirts, Cole? Do you remember? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so Great. So we can, if council is satisfied that with that, we can just um, ask staff to explore or scope or see how that would work. Councillor Fisher. Yeah, when we're talking First Nations, it always comes around back to the Truth and Reconciliation um, list. And mm -hmm. as a council, our government, we don't ever mention that. And I know. Um, so what I think would be current would be to somehow be able to say, yes, we're aware of that list. And yes, we agree with working on those points that are listed. I think there's 90 some points. And that we always have this awareness and that if any of those items arise in our, our functions, we're to work on them if, where we can. Because that is never mentioned in our, our work, um, the truth and reconciliation. And I think we should say, yeah, we know it's out there. And yes, we, we should work on whatever it is we can improve from our corner of the world. Okay. Any further comments on the, thank you very much, Councillor Fisher and, and uh, good points. And any further comments at this time? If I could just offer Vicki, the, the County of Huron has a reconciliation statement that has been prepared by our staff. And it is, we have the opportunity to use that at any special meetings that it is so desired. 
hired to do so. So, you know, I just wanted to offer that as far as uh, communication. Terrific. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, I believe that uh, there's a good list of projects going forward. I have notes on what I will provide you with next. There's a couple of contacts that I'll provide you with. Um, and so if council is satisfied and staff is um, clear on the direction, I just would um, call for any further comments. If everybody is happy with where we've landed today and happy with staff moving forward on the stated objectives and priorities. Jen? Yeah, just a question as to, uh, I agree with everything that's said, happy that staff's gonna work on it. So the process going forward would be that eventually staff will come back with this report suggesting that we go about it this way. Council talks about it, says, yeah, kicks it back they go forward? Is, is that kind of how it works, Mark? <laughs> I don't know. I think the best thing to do is leave with staff and we'll figure it out and stay tuned. I would suggest that next steps are not dissimilar to the last time we met. And so staff came back with a summary of the conversation, listed the priorities, um, and then um, proposed next steps. So I would assume, and I don't want to assume, but I would um, suggest staff would take a similar approach so that you have that continuity of outcomes um, from all of your strategic discussions. Um, so I think, at, I think at this point, it's in very capable hands who will come back to you with some sort of report um, and some sort of plan as to how that would move forward and then um, suggestions of who would be involved in the next steps as they move forward from this planning discussion that we've had today. Does that seem reasonable? Okay, good. That's good. Terrific, and so that wraps up our agenda for today. Um, and I would like to thank you so very much for spending the time with us, for being so engaged in the conversation. Um, it's sometimes very hard to get people to talk in a, in a Zoom type setting, especially over three and a half hours. Um, so it's, it's been lovely. It's great to see you all again. And I look forward to continuing uh, doing work with you. Uh, and if there's any way our department can help you, um, please reach out and we're happy for conversations. And then I turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vicki. And, and on behalf of all of council and our staff that are in attendance today, I know we would want to thank you very, very much for the leadership that you have shown on our strategic planning again today. And to Cole, thank you very much for everything that you do in this process also. When we originally discussed strategic planning, how are we going to go about it? There's one name that come up and that was Vicki Lass. So thank you very much, uh, Vicki and Cole again for, and it's very important that we always, yeah, a round of applause for Vicki. Thank you. And Cole. It's always very important that at points in time, we pause and say, okay, how are we doing? Are we on the right path? Are we fulfilling our mission value and our strategic plan? And what's the plan going forward? And we've done that today. So thank you very much for leading us forward with that. We sincerely all appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So with that, thank you everyone, uh, to all members of council for all of your input and, and to our staff. As I said at the outset, we are a team and we appreciate and value everyone's input. And we work together for the betterment of all of our residents that we have shown again today. So with that, thank you and to all. And I would entertain a mover and a seconder to adjourn this meeting, if you would, please. Councillor Miltonberg, move. Councillor Vanstone seconds that Ashfield Colburn Walwinosh Township Council does now adjourn at 1 36 p.m. to meet again February 1st, 2022, at 9 a.m. or at the call of the mayor. All in favor of the motion. And that is carried. And thank you very much. And please all, all continue to stay safe.